Thanks everyone for joining. I am very thrilled because I am returning back to this platform again after a long time due to election and uh, all my code of conduct. I was disconnected with you all people and I was missing you all. And now again back, I'm feeling really good. Of course, I lost it. So maybe that's why maybe I heard lost by a thin margin of 10 votes, but lost is lost. So again, I'm back. And uh, today again, you know, now we have with us small store with uh, Mehta and Mehta Sudhakar, my old friend also. And uh, his pet topic and also my pet topic being uh, SSB members was secretarial standard. If anyone say anything wrong about a secretarial standard and we can argue for hours and hours or maybe days for why it should be required. Because we know the logic and reason and the efforts put in to do this secretarial standard and guidance note. You know, people don't read guidance note even though we keep on telling guidance note is a free secretarial advice. When we were drafting this guidance note, PCS was telling her, boss, de dega, query ka answer, <laughs> pas. That was the scene we have drafted. That we have used all our experience and squeezed it. In. And uh, so all friends, I request not only secretary standard, develop the habit of guidance note. It's like act and rules regulation. You have to read together. Have developed that habit. We have with us today our own friend Miss Sarda also to share uh, knowledge and uh, I will just uh, leave formal introduction to Sudhakar and I'll request Sudhakar uh, to introduce her and uh, I will request uh, Mr. Bala to give a few words on the topic and then we can start there. Mr. Sudhakar? I think Deepthi Deep now you don't need to, I mean my introduction is not required week after week. I think by now all the, everyone most of more or less knows no, me. No, no, well. you introduce uh, Miss Sarda. No? Okay, okay, okay. I'll introduce Sarda. Definitely I will introduce that. In fact, you know, Deepthi when we were talking about the secretarial standards, I have become a bit of nostalgia. I know okay, the days when we used to work up to the early morning, up to 3, 3.30 throughout the nights and then immediately we used to rush to the institute around 9 o'clock and we used to work. And whether it is a passion or pagalpan, I really don't know that. But at the end of the day, when I look back my professional journey, these are the really golden years you know, that from 16th to 19th, where we have one set of, uh, I mean, I, I worked with one set of uh, colleagues as SSB board. And thereafter, from 19 onwards till date, I have worked with another set of colleagues. But I must say that every one of us are equally passionate about this. The only thing is that bonding, the personal bonding, what we were having, unfortunately, because of COVID, that we couldn't have with that uh, new set of people. And all. But even there also, okay, that there are a few people that we had certainly that kind of a bonding, understanding. Because when you work on these kind of topics, which are very, very complex, and when each one of us wants to put our soul virtually into that so that the fraternity gets benefit, the profession gets benefited, and the institute village, uh, sorry, institute's image will be further enhanced. In fact, when Malaysian government has written to the Indian government and to seek sought permission to adopt our standards, obviously that is a feather in the cap of ICSI certainly, you know. And all we all can take the pride of that particular thing, you know. So, Actually, and uh, we, have, we have drafted the act. We can say we have drafted. Correct. The act, which yeah, 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 absolutely, so absolutely. And. And not only yeah. that act, the clear explanation, logic, preamble and all that. And the thing that, uh, you know, in IBC, they have adopted this majority of our standard. Not only that, they are also writing and that like secretarial standard for creditors meeting also there should be standard. And IBI is also looking for that actually. That stage it has reached now. Absolutely. In fact, you know, that we also have to, I mean, the participants may kindly take a note of this thing. When Companies Act 2013 was legislated and enforced from 1st April 2014, the kind of complexities what this act was having at that point of time, it was really an arduous task for to interpret and implement this particular act at that point of time for all the professionals. And 2015, in fact, when the 1st July 2015, when this standard was made mandated, there was so many ambiguities were there in the act and act was silent at several places. And we have taken 
whether to take the liberty or not to take the liberty, how the regulator will take a view, suppose if we take the liberty, if we are just keeping quiet and reproducing what is there in the act, then what is our value addition? There were several issues with which we have really grappled with and ultimately we could brought this thing. In. Then, of course, we had a revision of that standard in uh, 1st October 2017 onward that was enforced. And again, the same thing and a lot of experiences, whatever we had because of that. In fact, we could brought again that revisions also the, by that time uh, that was the understanding, the maturity has come and we could further oh, revise data. Oh, at the same point of time, you might all be also be known that initially there was a lot of uh, commotion and dissentment was there as far as the standards are concerned. But by now, everybody has gladly accepted this and everyone of us got benefited. And what are the benefits and all, how we have to take advantage of this, how these standards are going to take care of us in the case of any rainy day. With all these things, Sharada is going to make her presentation. And before the inviting Sharada to do that, let me give a brief intro of Sharada. I think she is also a very well-known uh, professional across India. But having said that, it might be a customary also. And at the same point of time, by any chance, if anyone doesn't know about the speakers of the day, her credentials, you know, just to give a brief intro about her, Sharada is a company secretary and a law graduate with over 25 years of professional corporate experience. And she is an executive aluminous of IIM Bangalore and a distinguished Toastmaster certified by the Toastmasters International USA. Sharda has served ICSI in many capacities as the first woman chairman of Bangalore chapter in 2014, a member of the Auditing Standards Board in 2019, and a member of the expert group on sectoral standards of ICSI since 2020 till date. She has addressed students, professionals, and entrepreneurs on various professional topics at colleges, corporate bodies, industries, ICSI, and she loves writing and has been publishing her fortnight, fortnightly e-newsletter called Samhita for the last 13 years that carries all regulatory updates. And I am a very ardent fan of her editorial pages of this particular newsletter. And she's currently serving the board of Raichur Power Corporation Limited as an independent director. And I, in fact, you know, anybody acting as an independent director, I say that they have a lot of courage to do that. So she has that kind of a courage. And she is also a trustee of Matru Foundation and NGO for especially abled children being run by Arjun Awardee and Padma Shri Dr. Malati Holla. And she, uh, one more, the, in fact, you know, key that uh, the, what's called as an, I always uh, respect her a lot because of this thing that she is a cancer survivor and a cancer victor. She battled the breast cancer successfully in 2013. She actively leads and mentors a few cancer support groups. She has shared her thoughts on breast health as a speaker at various forums and TV channels. She has also uh, offered many life lessons to offer and is grateful to the people power that she enjoys. In fact, you know, that maybe at Mehta and Mehta also at one point of time, uh, we will uh, certainly request Sharada to take up this particular awareness program. Apart from that thing, you know, that in fact, see that anybody has cancer, you know, the moment that word, such a dreadful word, this thing, and people got perturbed and done okay that a person before he die, I think almost 80 to 90 percent, the entire family gets disrupted completely. You know? So during that period, in fact, sometimes you know okay, that these kind of words, say for example, then we will realize actually what in the profession or in the personal life, the small irritants, what we face, then we think as if the, the we are going to face the doomsday. And in fact, you know, okay, that. I still remember when can this um, Sharda for the first time when she was introducing herself in the expert committee meeting, she said that I am a cancer survivor. And I can see the kind of pride with what she said. I was really perplexed, you know, by that normally people hide these kind of things, you know, no one says boldly about that. And to say that, though it was by utter surprise, but at the same point of time, then I thought that, see the amount of courage what she has, and the amount of confidence what we can impose in her leadership qualities and all. I think with this small intro, Sharda, that I request you. Now, Bala, would you like to say something before we yeah, uh, for, sure. I mean, formally invite that to today's yeah. speaker and to make her presentation? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Good morning to all of you. I have a great pleasure in welcoming you all for this today's session. We have a great eminent people who has been part and parcel of Secretary Standard Board. 
and I don't have to say anything on cigarette standard because we are going to have her deliberations here. But only small thing I want to share being a old timer. I became a company secretary somewhere in the year 1994, much before the cigarette standard was in place. It was in the old ICAP 1956. The first and foremost thing is I want to understand because I'm getting into the profession immediately after passing the examination. I become a company secretary directly. Because those days, you know, what happens is the headcount used to be counted in the uh, multinational companies. They don't want to increase the headcount. I was basically a, what do you call, controller of accounts. Oh, you have passed the company secretary examination. You will actually look after the company secretary also. Because we don't want to increase the headcount. You will be the controller of accounts and company secretary. That is how I become an accidental company secretary. So naturally, in the year 1994, I wanted to understand. So I visited some of the leading companies, like, you know, those days, Greaves, Cotton and Company, Mahindra and Mahindra, such companies. I talked to the people to whom I know about the practices followed in writing the minutes, sending the notices. Even I have gone through the memorandum article of association. During that course, I might have seen at least seven, eight companies. Everybody is following a different practice, different procedure of their own. There is no unified procedure was there at all. That was the thing. Then I was at the perplex. What should I do? When I talked to my bosses, oh, we are actually, you know, part of the Greaves Cotton group of company. What Greaves Cotton is doing, we should do that. So this is what it has actually happened. But anyway, I devised my own system. That time I did not follow any of the thing. I did not copy it, etc. But the thing what has happened is the birth of the secretarial standards have taken place only after 2000. I think probably the secretarial standard board was formed around 2000 and thereafter this has come. I had an opportunity to serve the secretarial standard board but I could not because I was actually nominated. One meeting I attended, thereupon I have been taken up a job in overseas with the result I could not actually continue because of that. But one thing I understood very clearly Whatever the secretary standard has started, it was aiming as a unified procedure for across the companies, bringing the transparency. Today, if we talk minutes, every company secretary will understand what is the way the minutes to be written, what are the contents, what is should there, what is the essential, all those things. Today, everybody talk in the same language, not the different language. This is one thing which is, you know, what you call standard operating procedure, we call it in ISO 9000. That is what the secretary standard has brought actually today. Because we are all under the same footing. The credit goes definitely, definitely all the secretarial members who worked for years together while the night as Mr. Sudhagar puts it correctly. Hats up to all of you, sir. And second thing is there again, there are many places the interpretation because when we talk different people interpret different things when you look at the law different interpretation is as actually possible but the second standard is actually brought in and set right the ambiguities that is one thing and especially in the companies where the company secretaries are not required to be employed today i am talking about the private companies small companies msme companies etc and all this thing somebody takes their responsibility writing the minutes etc and other things and all this thing so that, you know, what happened, the second standard today, along with the guidance note is issued, really, really serves a greater help for those companies here. Because you might have also seen many of you, because very recently, the ROC has been taking with the various issues. I come across in one of the companies, for about three or four years, the company's minutes, ROC has gone through it. The various aspects, like, you know, giving the meeting number, and again, the serial number, starting of the meeting time, concluding of the meeting time, all the things were actually not uh, mentioned. And although the signal standard and the guidance notes talk about it, this was taken by them. It was one of the order called by the Karnataka Bangalore. If those of you interested, I can quote the uh, case also. But the company has been heavily penalized around three and a quarter lakh rupees for the company and around 65,000 rupees for each of the director, not only the present director and the past director. So that is the things which has actually taken place now. So really speaking, the second standard is really helps to at least, you know, follow the uniform procedure, reduce the litigation, bringing the transparency among the people, and at the end, it will improve the governance to the greater extent, even the small companies. 
I think with these few words, I pass on to Sharda. Sharda is actually, as Sudhagar puts it, I've got many, many credentials. I had a liberty to interact with us and some of the forums, etc., and other things and all. Apart from whatever Sudhagar said, she is also, you know, conducting the various assessment procedure for the post-qualification membership students also with the institutes of company secretaries. She is in a, what you call, multiple, multiple capacity. Really, really, I have a hats off to her. Real women empowerment as an example, as a leader. Madam, all yours. Thank you. Thank you both for that very, very generous uh, introduction and also the personal uh, comments. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Mehta and Mehta for giving me this opportunity, specifically Sudhakar, Professor Bala and uh, Deepthi also. Uh, I, I was just looking at the score below. It's already crossed. At the moment Professor Bala started speaking, it's crossed 100. It's already at 116. Why this is important is the flavor of the, this is, you know, the flavor of the season is what? The V3 for company secretaries, it's the V3 portal non-functioning of the V3 portal and everybody is debating and trying to understand how to grapple with these challenges. The second one is there are a lot of uh, sessions going on concurrently now about budget. Despite this, I think with Sudhakar as the chief consultant, he has made sure that secretarial standards will never lose the flavor of the season. It's just like, you know, their fashion is so fickle like weather. And uh, so many types of fashions keep coming and they get repurposed. But if you see the Indian sari, it will never go out of fashion. So I think uh, secretarial standards will never go out of fashion, but like the speakers had already mentioned, because this is the bedrock of governance for corporate India. So with these few words, I would also, uh, every, I mean, both Sudhakar and Professor Bala, they said we don't need an introduction, but I want to, uh, say that I feel very safe being with them because they are marathoners. So if you are thinking they are marathon, uh, they are walking the marathon, I don't know, they may be doing that, but I would like to call them marathoners in, in, in two different ways related to the knowledge. One, Sudhakar, I don't know, he may have lost count in the number of uh, sessions that he is addressing, whether in person or webinars. Maybe Sudhakar, you will get into uh, you know, Limka Book of Records very soon. I don't know whether you're tracking that. Uh, kudos to you. That's the passion that you have and the knowledge and the simplicity in the way you present it. That's what uh, really appealed to me when I heard you for the first time. Professor Bala, all of us know every other day there is an article by him analyzing something or the other in taxmen. So both of you are bringing in that kind of passion, which is very inspiring to many of us, including the youngsters. So that's why I call you both, uh, you know, marathoners in this knowledge sharing. With those few words, I will uh, formally start this presentation. And as I have been told, uh, I think this is a, uh, it's not that the Q&A will be at the end. At any point in time, I think both of you will be uh, sharing your thoughts. I mean, feel free to uh, stop me anywhere you want. Sharda, in the year 2007, <laughs> as back as 2007, <laughs> Mm. When I visited the UK Institute of Chartered Secretaries, those days, today it is one of the governance institute. Those days, I think four secretary standard was brought out by the institute. I carried it with me. Mm. I handed over to them. The president of that institute at that particular time, he was very, very fascinated. Mm. He actually said that I am adding this to our library. This, In fact, we are also going to bring out some sort of the guidance note, etc. and other thing and all this will help us. It has actually put in the UK secretary library there at that time only in 2007 when the secretary standard was not mandated at that particular time. Great, sir. You know, this, this kind of nuggets, you know, it, it reinforces uh, the good work that all of us are doing and our institute is doing. It's our responsibility to uh, share this and make sure that there is compliance. I will proceed with the presentation. Yeah, please. Yes, this, this point was already made <clears throat> by Sudhakar that uh, we should all be proud that this is a made in India product for the world because other countries have also adopted this. And just now, Professor Bala said that this was even before it became mandatory, it was already accepted and uh, uh, taken up by the UK Institute. <clears throat> so this has got a legacy, which means it's a 
uh, responsibility also for all of us to make sure that the governance is there through the secretarial standards, which is relating to board meetings. A small disclaimer. Uh, uh, this was already stated, but quickly, this is definitely an SOP or a standard operating procedure for uh, company secretaries. This is a vision for secretarial standards. It furthers the shareholders' democracy. When you look at all the secretarial standards, which are mandatory, not mandatory, which are there, ultimately, <clears throat> this is what this leads to. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, over the years, especially with uh, the implementation of the new Act, Companies Act 2013, we as members and the Institute also has got a lot of recognition through SS. And that is why there are so many knowledge sharing sessions about SS. Uh, there is better corporate disclosure, the kind of disclosures which have to be made and the processes which have to be uh, followed. It uh, encourages uh, transparency. The interpretation of law also is helped. You can look at some of the case laws, which Professor Bala will be uh, discussing uh, later on. The whole setup, like uh, Deepti was explaining about, you know, how interpretation uh, take, I mean, how many hours, man hour, women hours have gone into preparation of the secretarial standards. It is brought together in the one roof. Uh, the professional methods and practices which have to be followed by corporates. It enhances corporate culture. If you also look at the investments coming into the country and out of the country, when you have joint venture partners, they really, this has helped to enhance the confidence levels of the joint venture partners in the governance and decision-making at the top level in the company. It improves the quality of secretary practices. These are a few points which are it's, which is both the vision for the SS and we are able to see over a period of time this has all resulted in very tangible outcomes for corporates. This is a snapshot of you know what board meetings and uh, SS. What are the sections which are covered? Meetings of the board, quorum, circular resolution, and, <coughs> and section one hundred and eighteen in particular, which is. Uh, I know uh, through which secretary standards has become part of the law and it is enforceable, section 205 and read with all these rules. Overall, if you look at the secretary standards, there is reference drawn from all of this and uh, from which the secretary standards have been put together. Now, Deepti ji was talking about why guidance note is also equally important and look at secretary standards plus the guidance note. So, it's important to understand what is secretarial standards. It is a codified set of governance practices. And what is the key objective? It is to integrate, harmonize, and standardize. Like she was saying, all over the country, even Professor Bala was mentioning that there were different practices. Sometimes there was nothing in existence. There were different practices which were there. And uh, there were always variations in how things were being done. Though there was the law, there was no harmony in the practices. So the purpose is to integrate, put all of them together, harmonize and standardize. And like the speakers before me have mentioned, this has not come um, you know, overnight. So many days, so many months of meetings have taken place, though I have uh, uh, you know, been part of this since 2020. And from the time we joined, it was all virtual. Only a few meetings for RPT, we did it in person. But I can understand the kind of efforts which have gone into this perhaps right from the year 2000. And the diverse secretarial practices followed by companies have all got standardized. That's what you see in, and we also know in practice many times the CFOs and the directors are asking what's there in the guide, what's there in the secretarial standards, or can we look at the guidance note when we go for audit? So that is the kind of significance that this has gained. Now, what is guidance note as such? So guidance note, as the name goes, it explains the procedural and practical aspects. It has got illustrations, it has got query clarifications, it has got highlights, it has got annexures, every possible tool to make it easy for us professionals to help implement the secretarial standards. So that is what it is and it is relevant for all the stakeholders. Now quickly, this is another snapshot just to show you what does it cover? There are secretarial standards. One is fairly simple, just nine standards, starting with how to convene a meeting, what is the frequency of the meeting, attendance, uh, chairman, role of chairman, 
passing of circular resolutions, there is a, a very good uh, tips and practices given there in the guidance note. Minutes Secretarial Standard 7 has been dealt with extensively in the guidance note. Then there is also a standard on preservation of minutes and records. Finally, on what kind of disclosures are expected. So this is what will be covered. Obviously, it is quite extensive, especially the guidance note. So I have tried to put together a few highlights, some practical aspects. There are also some queries which have been answered, but I don't think we'll have time for that because we will be having a lot of uh, live queries here. Now let's look at the applicability. As Sudhakar has already mentioned, the secretarial standards were first released as effective from 1st July 2015. It was again revised in 2017. Later, I understand that the pre, uh, predecessor secretarial standards board or the expert group had again sent some amendments based on the changes happening in the law to the MCA, but uh, which is still to see the light of the day. But guidance note has been kept very current. So the latest one was during the corona, we worked on the guidance note based on whatever changes came about in CBLODR and also in uh, Companies Act. And uh, this is the latest one. So if you want to refer to, look at uh, the one which was released in December 2020. Now, these are relating to the effective dates. Shall now, just one minute, it, I will, shall the just one minute, I will sure, sure, sure. give a value addition here. Is yeah. that, uh, see, some of the participants may think that why the secretarial standard was revised only with effect from 1st October 2017 that was applicable. After that, why the revision has not taken place and why the guidance note was amended. See, the revision has taken place because you all might be knowing SS1 is a part of the Companies Act. It is mandated under Section 118, Subsection 10. Because of even comma full stop, if we have to change in secretarial standard as such, it requires approval of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. The revised standard was already submitted to Ministry in the year 2018, 2019 itself. But after that, the COVID has come, and after because of that, uh, it could not be taken up. And again, uh, a few months before we have followed up with the ministry, the ministry said, why can't you just have a look at it once again and then submit it? They have raised a few queries also, which have been replied by the, the uh, ICSI. So now it is in the under the active consideration of MCA. Once we get the MCA approval, that revised SS will be published. Then at that point of time, the SSB thought that uh, in the meantime, why can't we uh, update the guidance note? Because this guidance note, whatever we are writing, that is within the purview of the ICSI, it is just requires the approval of the Council of ICSI, and then it can be published. That's why what we thought was, whatever the latest position was there as on 31st December 2020, the guidance note has been updated accordingly. So guidance note is definitely in line with SS1 only because of that. You can take it as if the guide, the SS1 is there in place and accordingly the guidance note has been updated. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're looking at applicability, <clears throat> so this is applicable to all private and public limited companies, whether listed, unlisted. It's also applicable to the committees of the board, which are statutorily required to be formed under the act. That is your audit committee, nomination and remuneration committee, CSR and stakeholder committee. So there could be others like <coughs> risk management committee or any other finance committee, purchase committee. If the company wants, if the board wants, they can voluntarily adopt the secretarial standards because they're in any case used to following it. But otherwise, this is applicable to the board committees as well. And uh, in my uh, experience, if somebody wants to adopt it, you can't pick and choose. It's better that you adopt and uh, completely and make it applicable to all the deliberations and uh, uh, you know, meetings. It is also not applicable to, there are some exemptions. If you look at it, one person companies, it's not applicable and also section eight companies, that is you are not for profit companies, including international finance companies. This is why this notification 2017, it's not applicable to both private and public IFSs. Now, We'll just pick, uh, I will cover all the secretary standards. Sharda, just one more minute, yes. one more minute. I would like to add one more thing in the previous slide, please. See, a question was always raised uh, wherever we used to, in those days, we, I mean, go and ad, uh, do the advocacy for SS1. 
they used to say that why SS1 is made mandated for the private limited companies. Because this governance, applicability of the rules, regulations, and everything should be more for the listed companies like Reliance Industries. Why for private limited companies, the SS has been made mandated? You know, so much of paperwork, so much of this, that, and all. There used to be a lot of criticism was there in those days. I used to say always, I used to give an example when I was making my presentations, also a small video, I used to put it that where the seat, importance of the seat belt was, uh, I mean, I don't know, given in that part of small video. So I used to, after presenting that video, I used to say that the seat belts important is for a small car like Maruti 800 or for a Mercedes car. Because for the car like Mercedes, the build the, the body of the car was been built up in such a way it can absorb the accidents also the impact of an accident similarly it got number of seat belts not only for the driver even for the co-passengers also which is not the case with maruti 800 the vulnerability of maruti 800 the smaller vehicle is much more than a bigger vehicle so according to me if ss1 is important it is for the private limited companies where absolutely no paperwork is there nothing is there and tomorrow when God forbid there is a dispute among the shareholders Correct. or the among the promoter's <clears throat> family. Most of the times, if you see the oppression and mismanagement cases, those are all pertaining to these private limited companies only. So we used to say that if you want to reduce the propensity of litigation, SS1 is the best medicine for that. In fact, at several forums, I said that according to me, SS1 is more important for private limited companies and closely held public companies than of the listed companies. The listed companies, anyway, they are there on the radar of the regulators, always, 24 by 7. The ignored companies were these private limited companies. No one bothers unless until there is a litigation in those private companies. So if any participant is working for smaller companies or if you are in practice or in service, why the importance of applicability of SS1 is for the private limited companies? If your management or your clients are asking you, this is the answer what is to be given. No, I, I, I fully agree, Sudhakar. Uh, we are also see. Yeah, please go on. Yeah, even in the Reserve Bank of India, the risk management committee, which is applicable, that is also governed under the company sect and also secretarial standard, that Boston Circular says that. And second thing is that the, even the private limited company can also be registered as a non-banking financial company. The moment you register a private limited company as a non-banking financial company, the audit committee, committee becomes mandatory correct. for that, though under the company's act, it is not required. Correct, but, correct. but categorically, RBI says, when you appoint the audit committee under the private limited company for NPSC companies, all the laws which are governing the audit committee as per the company's act, including the general standard, is correct. actually applicable. That is what the circular is there, actually, when you talk about the private limited company. I agree. Also, Sudhakar, what you said is true. You gave an example of the small car and the big car. Also, there are many people who are arguing, uh, should we really insist on this when the company and the promoters are just starting off and they're trying to do business? But uh, let me also tell you that what you don't learn as a child, whatever we learn in our childhood in the news, that carries through. You may feel it is difficult, but that becomes so much part of you. Then when the company starts growing, you go for listing. This is very smooth because you're already used to this rigor of this uh, SS1. And I think today we are seeing in many of the startups, we may not be able to take the names, but those of them who are not used to secretarial standards or to the uh, governance in general, suddenly they find when they grow big, they're also seeing that there are so many frauds which are coming up. Investors are investigating and finding out that things, you know, there are accounting frauds, there have been delay in holding uh, uh, AGMs, there are many issues. So if you trace back everything, if you start following this process completely, then, uh, you know, the outcome will be natural. In so fact, it Sam, is important. Just to, uh, just to add one more line to what we have said further to that is, in fact, uh, several times it happens that company secretaries, especially prior to Companies Act 2013, they used to feel shy of saying that they handle the board meetings and prepare the board agendas and minutes. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, whenever I used to call, I mean, take the interview of the for my department in those days, when I ask them that the questions pertaining to the board meeting, they used to say that, you know, sir, I don't handle the routine matters. That is, my team is there to handle mm. that. What you handle, everything and anything other than the secondary work. So the core area of the function, he was not having that expertise. 
they doesn't know the importance of handling a board meeting because that tomorrow if anything any decision is challenged in the court of law the first and foremost thing what will come to the scrutiny is whether the convening the board meeting is there as per law or not the moment it is not there the decisions taken may be completely vulnerable and after that question comes ki by how to prepare the minutes most of the company secretaries with all due regard they think that preparation of minutes is a child's play it is not so correct in fact some people they used to start in the present tense go into the past tense and future tense what not while drafting the minutes and several courts have passed strictures sometimes you know okay about the company secretaries the way they handled they prepared the minutes the minutes were not giving anything based upon which they can give the judgment because it was completely skeleton minutes you know they used to write the board discussed and deliberated the matter and passed the following resolution that's it and what the discussions have taken place on what basis the informative decision has been taken or not these things were not there fortunately after ss1 has been mandated the seriousness of the board meetings the seriousness of the minutes the importance of all these things have been uh, realized by the fraternity and now the things have been improved to a large extent this is what in fact some of my lawyer friend told me recently courtesy icsi he by that in one of the case where he was arguing the minutes have been produced and the judge has mentioned that the way the minutes have been drafted is improved a lot so that we, we can take we can take the credit to our, i mean for this particular uh, this thing so that to add to you i don't want to mention the name of the company but in one of the company there are some certain financial decisions were taken on that there were some issues over there the matter actually went to the income tax department the very first and foremost thing is income tax department call for the minutes of the meetings of the board almost for about 3 years because the transaction actually run over about 2 3 years and consecutively repeatedly so they call for the 3 years when they gone through the 3 years the problem is you know taking the minutes out of the register office of the company etc naturally we will have to follow the procedure take the necessary thing for the board resolution authorize somebody to take care of all those things which we have done and ultimately he carried he has to sit there after going through the minutes in some of the places the preamble it is said as per the paper presented to the board which is preserved as a part of the records that is what it is recorded because minutes itself is not self explanatory so ultimately they have called for those records what are those records we would like to know to that extent has gone it has become a marathon task for the company to find out because it dating back from eight or nine years back so that was the issue so as you rightly say if the minutes are correctly adopted if the rational behind taking the decision is actually understood by just looking at the minutes that will solve lot of the issues actually when it goes as the evident to the regulators i'm sorry very... that actually we are eating your time but uh... one more thing has also come to my mind bala is that most of the times company secretary says that there is no creative scope is there in this in fact there is a lot of scope is there to show your creativity to show your efficiency to show your effectiveness while drafting the minutes in fact you know ki by draft the way you draft the minutes people should know who is the company secretary who has drafted these minutes that is the you see normally people say that after after you do your work you know okay, that it should have your signature there or that that kind of an impact it should be there so same is the case as far as the minutes are concerned also tomorrow that if we really we are to call ourselves as a good company secretary or a good professional we have to draft the minutes agendas backup papers everything in such a way god forbids if there is a litigation it should be a cake walk for the management they should not curse the person who was there at that point of time in the seat as the company secretary who has put the company into a difficulty yeah the minutes has to speak for itself correct yeah rohan so is going just, to rohan yeah, is just, asking rohan is asking why specific any specific reason for ss1 is not applicable for opc and section 8 company opc it's a, of course the board can be multiple with only one perhaps uh, bev sudhakar you want to answer because you may have uh, yeah yeah i see that, that is the primary reason in case of a that there were no one person company he is the only person who is there there is no actually that meetings and all also only thing is you have to just put a minute and then record it there 
So, no, but Sudhakar, in OPC, board can be larger, right? No, no, board can be larger, no doubt about it. But very rarely it happens, the board is larger. It is always actually go with one person company like that only. That is the primary reason. And second thing is, as far as Section 88 company is concerned, Section 8 company, from the procedural formalities, it is exempted. As far as the minutes are concerned, the minutes are to be recorded within the 30 days only. Correct. But we always used to say that, despite the fact that exemption is there, but in fact, you know, if I'm not wrong, I'm not very sure, but if I'm not wrong, one, one person company got some kind of leeway as far as Section 118 is concerned also. That also might be one of the reasons why SS1 is exempted as far as OPC companies are concerned or Section 8 companies are concerned. I'm not very sure, but if I'm not wrong, vaguely I remember that there are certain exemptions for these companies from 118 is concerned. But uh, my experience handling quite a few Section 8 today, Section 8 is not just in some uh, education, health, or you know, earlier it used I... to be really charitable. With CSR coming in, there's a huge focus on Section 8 and people who want to do not-for-profit activity, they are moving away from trust and society and moving to Section 8 only. And most of the companies which we are handling, they're pretty large and uh, they're all following secretary standards. Yeah. I think, in fact, this exemption should go because it's not just two meetings which they have. They have large boards. They're professionally run. Only thing is their purpose is, there's some social purpose is there and they may not be distributing the... Profits. So, Section and 8 companies, fact, many of them. Fact, let me say, following. let me say, in Reliance, you know, what we did was the procedures of the uh, what's called a board and committee, statutory committees, because SS1 is there. We have extended this to all the executive committees across the company. Mm. And because of that, the many meetings are so structured. Correct. The people are really happy, especially the people who are of the, the earlier ages. They used to say earlier we were never having the agenda properly, minutes were yeah. not properly prepared. Many meetings were not structured properly. Cuts in this secondary standards, you know, now we are having a structured meetings and structured records. In fact, sir, the Vodafone group of companies, Vodafone Foundation is one of the Section 8 company actually. Because many of the CSR activities for across the Vodafone group, I'm not talking about Vodafone idea, I'm talking the Vodafone private services group of companies. Their CSR activities actually done from the Vodafone Foundation company, which is actually a Section 8 company. But the company policies is across, as uh, Sudhagar puts it, and Reliance, across the company, including the Section 8 company, including the Secret Standard, is required to be followed. That is what the company has been actually following. Because I have opportunities for about five years there. So I know the procedure. That is the thing. So as and you rightly it, say, most of the Section 8 companies are yeah, actually yeah. adhering it. And in some of the Section 8, uh, they are, it's already there as part of the articles saying that you know secretarial standards will be followed so i think there is no debate on whether this is required not required what is the relevance of secretarial standards i think we have moved beyond all that the okay. is actually putting something secretarial standards are business models which one is better i'm not clear what exactly it is mine i don't um, think it's a business model i don't know yes yes this is this is Samir, very good afternoon morning. Yeah. Uh, yes. The thing is that uh, like uh, Balas has suggested that there are frauds which uh, never ever come in the picture, and the company secretary has to abide by the secretary standard. No doubt, say, so company secretary are there to adhere to rules and regulation of our guidelines for that matter. But there are certain business models which probably give that holistic approach to the particular organization to widen their horizon. So having said that, it won't be possible for the company secretary to understand their perspective, company's perspective in the terms of the, in the aspect of the business model itself. Uh, but then just because of the secretary standard, we are a compliance officer, but compliance is not the only thing that company wants to do. There are a number of things that company wants to grow in every aspect. So it it it, it is it create, creating a di diabolical approach in that kind of manner that whether the whether we stick to the uh, secretary standard or we should just follow the business model because the company wants to grow at any cost. Thank you. See, I think growing at any cost is what is creating a lot of trouble for many of the companies, if you see. I think one of the promoters recently admitted also saying that we were uh, in such a great hurry that, uh, you know, at any cost. So I think we should marry the two, Samir. It's not that one over the other. Secretarial standards or any rules relating to governance, there is always some kind of resistance from other departments. But 
It is our responsibility to make sure that the business, the way it is run, should be in compliance. I, I don't think you have a choice there, but you should see how to take these people along, create the awareness, get the buy-in from others so that you, because as a company secretary, I don't think, I mean, it's a, a single responsibility. We won't be able to implement it alone. You require the cooperation from so many other departments as well to ensure this. So we'll have to be uh, taking people along. Can I add it? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, I'll put not only secretary standard, but secretary standard than another law. So, you know, it's more pressure. Once banded, it keeps on banding. So, if you able to resist in the legal framework through legal planning, then the same if achievable. But certain thing you have to say no because the onus will come as a CS on you. And at that juncture, you will not get any benefit, but only no benefit of doubt also and the stress of compliance will be on CS. So, so far possible legal compliance in legal framework, little legal planning, you can work out, structuring you can work out to serve the business, but not uh, non-compliance. That will be today's secretary standard, tomorrow another law come into picture. That was my some call, thought. Thanks. Ma'am, ma with all due respect, uh, let me intervene in that front of Shamsha. The thing is that I'm talking about not law, I'm talking about a business model. Business model which probably company has having, as, uh, uh, because we are only stick to the compliance. We are not talking about the revenue generation and company having a, the holistic approach, having a revenue generation. So that is what I'm talking about. So uh, if at all, if the company having that kind of vision or uh, say goal or objectives, to uh, to go uh, overseas or to go globally and to pitch them and on the global platform, then it won't be possible to stick to the uh, standards in a long term basis on a long term basis. So that my suggestion is that which one we should we follow? Whether we should follow as a company to do security standards or the companies or companies vision of uh, expanding their uh, horizon on the globally. Sameer, uh, Sameer, uh, if I'm permitted to say that. Secretarial standard is a part of law. If you want to expand the horizon also, you have to expand the horizon in compliance with the law. You cannot expand your horizon without complying with the law. And let us okay. not take it that SS1 is a part of the law. If you accept the law is to be I mean, abided with or complied with, obviously this is not a kind of a, kind of a roadblock for you in expanding your horizon. Okay. Yeah. Sabir, okay. Sabir, when you said actually there is no option which one has to be adopted because secretarial standard is actually mandatory as Sudhagar puts it very correctly. It is actually a part of the law. So whatever you no, no, do, Andrei, whatever the business model you talk about it, it should be within the framework of the law. There is no sir, question Andrei, of Andrei, opting this or not opting that. No, no, agree sir, but I like to amplify that. Even if you like to um, I, uh, uh, obey or abide whatever the idea by but there are regulated bodies probably would not comply even if i say that there are regulated bodies would not be uh probably would not uh say uh, raise the red flag to the particular organization and eventually that organization would do whatever they want to do so yeah. irrespective of whatever i'm doing that whatever my job in thorough manner the regulated body would not do the co comply the whatever the job is supposed to do thank you yeah. Anyway, Sharda, I think we have we have we'll driven the on. point. We have driven the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, one, minute, one minute, one minute. I'll just want to say, yeah, yeah, sure. Samir, I agree the difficulty practically the CS face. It's okay, I understand. Sudhakar, we say that yes, law is to comply, but the CS also face. And as regards global presence, Samir, actually, uh, I'll put that way. I was when in SSD, I have drafted the secretary standard for various countries. And in, I will put that way that this is the standard for overall meeting. The kind of standard we have developed, you can apply to any organization or any meeting. So if you look at that way and you convince your management that this will be the, your kind of proof of all the meetings and all the commitments you are getting and making, this will protect you in future for your, you know, development, because when you are going internationally, you are prone to more risk and more legal dispute, and it will be so costly in unknown world, unknown land. 
So better we follow. Rather, I if you convince that way, it will help you. This is my thought. I understand you may be facing that, but this is my thought. I thought I will go through. Thanks a lot. Uh, before I move to the next slide, I just want to share that as company secretaries, it is not sufficient if we just have knowledge of the law. Two things I think all of us, we have to develop. One is the art of articulation. How do you articulate, whether it is to the board or any other stakeholder, how do you articulate your point? And sometimes without being aggressive, we may have to be very assertive in what we say and tell them that what will be the downside of non-compliance. So that is something that we have to pick up along the way, which many of us are lacking. Uh, we need to work on that. Okay, <coughs> I'll move on. Going to the first one, let's look at who has the authority to convene a meeting. It's a clear a summary of what the standard and the guidance note says. Any director may, including an independent director, uh, convene a meeting of the board. But what about the company secretary or any other person authorized by the board? So if you don't have a company secretary, the board can authorize any other person of the company. And they can, on the requisition of a director, so if a director requests them, they shall convene a meeting, but this authority is not unbridled. There is a rider, when they get a request from any director, they have to consult the chairman or the managing director or the whole time director, unless otherwise stated in the AOA. So this is the authority matrix, which is available for a company secretary or authorized persons. A few points on the guidance note, which I thought I'll highlight. Uh, as a best practice, the director who is requisitioning the board meeting should send a request in writing along with the proposed agenda, because if you just send call and say that uh, I want this agenda to be discussed. It is not easy for the company secretary to just put it up and take the uh, consent of the chairman. Now coming to the point below, if a director just requests that he does not give you in writing, so what should you do as a company secretary uh, or any other person, an authorized person? The best way is to you yourself put it in writing in an email to him and said, this is what I understand you want to be included in the agenda and uh, please confirm. So that it's very, very clear. I think having some things in writing, what you speak orally and what you have in writing in all types of uh, business dealings is very, very important that we have in writing because it's uh, critical what is placed before the board. So this is some guidance which has been given here. Now, any other person authorized by the board, whether it's an officer or a non-officer, it has to be clearly identified by passing a board resolution that who is authorized for this activity. Now they must get the approval of the chairman, managing director of WTD to convene the meeting unless otherwise provided in the articles. So Dakar, do you have any example here of what kind of stricter norms can be provided by, uh, by a company? No, see, the only thing is in the articles, you know, that as you rightly mentioned here in the rules also it is there. If the articles is silent about that, then the mm -hmm. company secretary, he cannot convene the meeting because one director is asking him if the chairman refuses. Taking this question on. has come up in one of the companies. In fact, to that point of the, it has been placed before the SSB at that time, what to be done. It was deliberated a lot about that, whether company secretary by default, whether he has the power to convene a board meeting. Because the director mm -hmm. is asking the company secretary to do it. So secretary is to the board, uh, I mean, his responsibility is towards the board collectively, not to a Correct. single director. So if the chairman says no, then he has to simply go and communicate it to the director concerned. Look, chairman is not doing that. Under that circumstance, if the director says, do I have the power to convene this meeting? Yes, company secretary has he to can. advise him. As Correct. for the law, he got the power, he may convene the board. Correct. I think I would request all the participants to go through the guidance note. There is extensive uh, uh, you know, guidance on this because we've had a lot of discussions on these points on what to do if the chairman refuses what should be the role, whether the company secretary should attend and facilitate that meeting. There are a lot of uh, points there. You can go through that. Uh, other point to be noted is even for statutory requirement, because sometimes, sometimes you advise the board that, uh, you know, audited accounts have to be placed at the AGM. This is the last date or some other uh, statutory requirement is there, even if that is there or they have not conducted within the 120 days uh, period. Uh, unfortunately, the company secretary does not have the authority to convene the meeting in his or her own capacity. So it is a kind of pressure which builds in, but we need to plan in advance and articulate and inform to the board that this is a requirement and this is what you have to do. 
So we move on to uh, 1.2, date, time, place, mode, and serial number of the meeting. Now, what when can you hold the meeting? On what dates and what days can you hold? A board meeting can be convened at any time on any day. That's what it says. But if there's an adjourned meeting for want of quorum, you cannot hold it on a national holiday. So we know national holidays, there are five uh, national holidays, your Republic Day, Independence Day, May Day, these uh, <coughs> Gandhi Jayanti. So keep this in mind when you are planning for the meeting and advising for the date. Now, the guidance note says, and it's also a good practice that the board meetings, though it can be held at any time of the day, convene it preferably during working hours because we definitely need the help of the secretariat and several other departments. Some of them have to be present as invitees in the meeting. They have to provide information. So it is better to hold it during working hours. It may spill over beyond working hours. Now, make sure to check the AOA that if there is a specific time, sometimes in AOA you say, uh, you know, the dates are mentioned or there's a calendar mentioned or in the board meeting itself in the beginning of the year, the board decides that what should be the calendar. If something is mentioned about the dates or about the time, please check that. Otherwise, the you know, you can advise the board to have the meeting at uh, any time or day of the meeting. Now, where can it be held? It can be convened at any place. There is no restriction on that. Now, mode of the meeting. Today, by default, it has become video conferencing or OAVM, that is other audiovisual uh, meeting. Though earlier also this was available, thanks to Corona, most of the meetings are being held by video conferencing. Now, recording of proceedings of such meetings, they are deemed to be made at the venue indicated in the notice. So normally it is, even if you're holding it through video conferencing as a practice, it is better that we mention uh, that the registered office is deemed to be the uh, venue of the meeting, but knowing fully well that uh, it may be completely video conferencing, everybody through video conferencing, or at least the chairman and company could be there at the registered office. So these are uh, important points to note. Serial number, uh, as a good practice, I'm sure many, many corporates were already doing it prior to 2013 Act, but from 2014, it became compulsory, and especially in the secretarial standards, it's mentioned that start numbering the meeting. If you are an existing company, they, there was a, a, a provision given that you start mention, start from 2015. Otherwise, new companies which are started after that, from the first board meeting started, you can have it as a financial year or you can have it as a calendar year. In many cases, we are also saying meeting for this, you just uh, number the meetings for that year, financial or calendar year, then restart once more from the next year. But whatever you do, be very clear that this is minuted and this is there as a decision of the board. Another important aspect to be noted is the numbering of the adjourned meeting. If this is the 12th original meeting, which is there in the year, the adjourned meeting also should be adjourned 12th board meeting. It cannot be a different number because obviously this is an extension of the original meeting. Can I move on, Sudhakar? Any point to be added here? The only thing I want to add here is about that uh, the, the meetings which were taking on the virtual mode during the mm -hmm. corona period. Mm -hmm. This question has come up by what about the venue of the meeting? Because in the notice, mm -hmm. you have to give that thing in the minutes, you have to record that. Yeah. So in case of AGMs, who used to say that it is to be deemed to be the register office of the company. And in case of board meetings, we advise that in the minutes, we used to record that the chairman's uh, residence you know, from where he's Correct. conducting the meeting may be deemed to be the venue of that board meeting also. That is what we also done, Sudhagar, where the chairman was placed. That yes. has been actually indicated as the venue of the meeting when we conducted the video meetings. And but, let uh, me also, uh, let, sorry, uh, yes, Sharma, please. No, I just wanted to ask, it is important that even if it is a video conferencing meeting, the venue has to be uh, mentioned. Right. Yeah, because yeah. many company secretaries are having this doubt and they're saying if it is video conferencing, we'll just say, we give a link and say this is being held by uh, video conferencing. But the venue has to be mentioned. And second thing is about the serial number for the meetings. In mm -hmm. fact, this is one of the things uh, where a lot of companies, uh, I mean, used to have a difficulty if I'm not wrong. But this has brought the seriousness of the meetings. In fact, it has arrested all kinds of nonsenses which used to take place earlier. True. And which we know it very well. And sometimes some company secretaries were unfortunately got into trouble because of these things where they were not there. But sometimes the minutes were uh, what's called as an okay that uh, they have been injected into the, the minutes and then some subsequently they have been summoned 
all these kind of things used to happen that uh, now that say because of the serial number that uh, the discipline and, uh, and the uh, what's called as okay, the seriousness has come to the table. Correct. And yeah. now yeah. since there is disclosure of the number of meetings also in the annual return and the post Correct. report, you can't keep inserting anything. You can't say some 4A, 4B, all this kind of, like you said, nonsense used to happen earlier. People would play mischief with these meetings. In so fact, the private, is... com private companies, small companies and MSME companies and all the things, they'll have to take very seriously on this particular matter. Correct. Because they normally missed out. Generally, that is what it happened. As I was mentioning in the beginning of the introduction only, it was a popular case in Karnataka ROC. This was a company called the Ruckus Wireless Private Limited Company, where you know the serial number was not mentioned, time of conclusion of the meeting was mentioned, time of beginning of the meeting was not mentioned. All the things were there, uh, uh, amongst other things. The company has been very heavily penalized. Penalized, so, yeah. So yeah. The people should take care of it. Yeah. In fact, I say just uh, okay. Uh, some people sometimes people may think, oh, no, this is all humbug only. This is not that thing at all." A few months before, one female company secretary was arrested by the police, and she has been given a judicial custody for three days. If I am not wrong, this is what I heard based on the press reports. Only I am telling you about this, not disclosing anything about that. What was the reason for that? What was the reason for that? That company secretary has certified a copy of the resolution. And that resolution was not part of the minutes at all. They might have thought that the minutes will be play, I mean, not recorded or something like that. Might be that company secretary at that point of time might have forgotten whatever had happened, happened. But this company secretary, unfortunately, she has not thought that fit to check the minutes before certifying the copy of the resolution. She has certified that based on which the banker has given, extended the financial facilities to the company and ultimately it was turned, I mean, the company could not, uh, I mean, uh, repay and all. And when the bank, uh, banker has found it, some kind of a, again, you know, okay, some fraud or something like that had happened and all. And ultimately in this crossword, the company secretary came into picture and got stuck with that. Because they have filed an FIR against the company secretary because based on that particular resolution, what she has certified, the loan have been given and all. After that, what happened, I couldn't have any kind of press reports and also I couldn't follow up the case also. But what I'm trying to say is that minutes or this kind of backdated things. In fact, at one point of time in very my formative year, somebody told me any kind of backdated thing is like a Ravan ka khol. Jaha pe girta hai, waha pe daltiya paida ho jata hai. And unnecessarily we will be in trouble because of that. All the drops wherever it is falling. Up. So one has to be very careful and cut CSS1. To a large extent, these kind of issues have been virtually stopped everywhere. I think SS1 also clarifies, you know, how and when you can issue CTC, certified through copy. Because earlier, I used to see that people would just issue the certified through copy, especially the small uh, companies. They won't have company secretaries. At the end of the year, they will, just before filing, they'll start creating all the minutes. But uh, that doesn't help. It leads you into all these kind of issues. In, in, in fact, in one of our clients' case, uh, the promoter, uh, you know, it's, it's not enough just to follow the SS1. You also have to look at your uh, shareholders' agreement and your articles. For example, in one case, there was a requirement that if there was a borrowing more than one crore, they had to take shareholders' approval also, though under the law it was not required. Now, without knowing that, if you just go ahead and give a resolution, then you are violating the articles. So there could be serious consequences. The banker kept pressurizing, but then my team member was able to convince the banker that don't pressurize, we will complete all this process, hold the meeting and then only give you. That's why I said as company secretaries, it's not just the knowledge, we should be able to manage these things within the framework of law. See, people should not think these are all procedural formalities. Yes. These are legal formalities. These are not yes. procedural formalities. And procedural part is a part of the legal part only. Correct, correct. Okay. Uh, now, participation through electronic mode. So, when you say participation through electronic mode, uh, uh, please note that teleconferencing, that is, for example, if somebody is present, you are not able to see and hear him, but you are only able to hear him on a telephone. That does not constitute quorum. Such a director with the permission of the chair can participate, but he will not be counted for quorum. And uh, whatever points uh, he gives may not be uh, included uh, in the minutes, in the deliberations, they can only uh, hear him out. So we have to be very, that's why it says audio visual means, which means both have to work. Now, 
earlier this was a requirement today of course it is still a requirement but uh, when when the audio visual means started in 2014 uh, it was uh, we used to take uh, whether the director wants to participate through electronic mode or in person we would take a declaration right at the beginning of the year but today it is almost become by default the reason is uh, if somebody wants to participate in electronically, then we will have to give him that uh, facility. And uh, if he wants to change his mind and say, I want to come in person, you cannot deny that. Now, why is it important as a company secretary, you have to make arrangements for the director to actually physically attend the meeting. These are small little things, but the success of a meeting, I'm sure people like Sudhakar who are part of large conglomerates, you will know that the success of a meeting depends not just on actually having the agenda, but on several other things that the uh, director is comfortable, he has all the information and he is in a good mood to be attending the meeting. Now, original and adjoint board meeting, they can be held through electronic mode. This is just as a clarification, both of them can be held or either of them can be held through uh, electronic mode. Now, all agendas today can be considered through electronic mode. There is no restriction. Earlier, there was a restriction, but this has been relaxed. These were the four or five items which were earlier restricted that you could not hold it through video conferencing. It got relaxed uh, while this MCA circular dated 30th December 2020. And finally, the rule relating to that is completely deleted, omitted in 2021. So as of now, you can have all your board meetings uh, through audio con uh, video conferencing. I'm moving to notice quite a few things here. I picked up a few points from the guidance note. How is a notice to be given? Uh, notice does not mean just inviting somebody for a meeting with a date, time, and venue. It also means there should be a detailed agenda with all the supporting documents uh, so that the directors can take the decision. Should be sent to all the directors by hand. That is one of the options or by post. It can also be by email. So email, you can also put it in the body of the email. It can be as an attachment, but if there are a number of documents in large companies, then you can also give a URL a link and say all these documents are available here uh, for your uh, reference. So it can be done, but it has to be done. Both the notice and the detailed agenda has to go to the directors. It should also be sent to the alternate director and the original director simultaneously. So original director will not be attending the meeting, but he will be made aware of what are the agenda points. Now, notice should be given even if the meeting is held on predetermined dates. Like I was explaining earlier, suppose in the beginning of the year, you have said, I have every third Friday of the quarter in the first month, there is a meeting or you have fixed dates of the meetings. Even if that is already known, if there is a calendar invite and which is blocked, but it is important and it is required that a notice should be sent for every meeting, even if the dates are known. Minimum seven days prior notice is required unless the AOA provides for a longer time. That means it cannot provide for a shorter time. It can be anything longer, except for if there are any UPSI uh, uh, matters which are coming up. There, uh, with the consent of majority of the directors, including at least one independent director, it can be lesser than seven days. Shorter, what about, yes. When I, when I was working in a company much before the second standard was in place, mm -hmm. it was a listed company. We used okay. to have what you call the key performance areas, which is actually agreed KPA. upon in the beginning of the year. KPS. Yeah. My KRA included mm -hmm. one of the item is issuing the notice of the board meetings and committee meetings, 10 working days in advance with all the supporting papers. That is the thing. And as soon as the meeting gets over, then the managing director will sit with me. He will actually take a review, what date you have sent, whether you have sent everything. This is there. All those things you will check in relation to the performance. That was the case earlier. So as you rightly said it, it is not only giving the notice, it is not only giving the agenda, it has to be full supporting documents in order to apply his mind and come prepared right. for the meeting. Yeah. See, what this calls for is we may uh, think giving a notice is you'll have a standard format. But what this calls for is a lot of planning and coordination, which the company secretary should be capable of. These are some of the leadership qualities, I think, which company secretaries have to develop because there are very few people reporting to a company secretary in a corporate. Sometimes it's only one or just two or three. 
and none of the other departments anybody will be reporting to you but it becomes your responsibility to collate gather information from all of them make sure that everything is uh, approved by the chairman and then it goes to the board there is lot of back end work which happens we are only looking at what's the outcome so these are things which come by experience but uh, it has to be planned out there are no two ways about that now yes. address for yes there is some related question is there on that can a consultant if authorized by the board circulate the board and the committee meeting notice through email however the notice and agenda will be signed by a director correct we are also doing i am a practicing company secretary that's why we make sure that there's a board resolution passed that uh, team members from this firm are authorized to that because uh, you don't know what is the uh, what is the credibility of any communication coming to the board there could be two notices coming so it is very important that if you are not a company secretary then if it is any other person authorized it has to be under the authority of a board resolution that can be done yeah that is right i also agree with you yeah now address for sending notice i mean you you can send it uh, postal address or it can be email address of the director which is registered with the company or if you don't have that you can look at what's the address mentioned in the din sometimes the directors also say particularly give it to this postal address or to this uh, email id they may also say please mark it to my secretary or somebody else so as a company secretary we need to be very 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 diligent and make sure one small lapse and the director is not able to attend the meeting then you are hold up so there are many issues which that is why this guidance note becomes important when you look at all these small points you know then your your chances of failing as a company secretary in your uh, duty really gets minimized when you start looking at the guidance note and start picking up some of the best practices here somebody saying seven days means seven clear days because this number of days requirement uh, overlaps with what is stated in lod here no according to me if there is a saturday sunday in between also it is fine yeah it is only seven days it is not seven yes. working days if yeah, i am yeah. not mistaken yeah 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 okay a few more uh, points to be noted relating to notice uh, Baba, let's look can at just draw attention in case a director who tendered his re resignation before convening the board meeting the company has received the notice from him whether the notice or agenda paper should be sent to them or not or him the effective date of the resignation matters yes when you say when he is resigned hmm. he can actually indicate the date of the resignation okay so that actually better you know to check what is the date of the resignation is there yeah so if that, nothing is mentioned it takes effect from the date it is given and yeah. actually the board doesn't have to approve his uh, resignation it only takes note Correct, but as it. a good practice uh if nothing is mentioned or if the futuristic date is mentioned as a good practice uh i would suggest that you give him also this uh, notice yeah if a futuristic date is there yes it is but it is yeah. the immediate effect or if he is actually effective from that particular date etc then he is no longer the part of the board so similar principle we can apply for the directors who are appointed by institution withdrawal and nomination of the directors both newcomers and outgoing correct yeah correct Okay, I think. Uh, just to, just to I add don't... one, just to add one point is, uh, for example, if a person receives the notice and agenda hmm. on the on the, suppose day one, and after that third or fourth day down the line before the board meeting, if he resigns, despite the fact he has received the board meeting notice and agenda, he has no right to attend the meeting, or provided he has uh, resigned with immediate effect. Correct. But sir, generally the resignation is subject to acceptance by the board of directors. Never, no, no, never, no, no, never. no, 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 not at all, no, no, not at all. No, no. Board only what has to is? take note of it. Note, That's note. All. Because it is his decision. He decided to resign. What are the date indicated? Is the resignation takes effect? Correct. Board has to only take note of it. Yeah. So I will move on. I don't know. <clears throat> It's already twelve <clears throat> fifteen. I am okay to extend it beyond that, but uh, keeping uh, the time in mind. i'll just move on uh, supplementary notes to the agenda while we say the notice with agenda with complete agenda has to be circulated it may so happen that you have some additional information or you want to modify some information which is already given it can be circulated you know it can be placed at the meeting or it can also be circulated uh, prior to the meeting but what uh, the guidance note says is permission of the chairman and majority directors including at least one independent director if there's an independent director 
who is present at the meeting required for taking up the agenda. For example, after you give the seven days notice, just two, three days before the meeting, you have given supplementary notes about some very important project which has to be approved. So the directors may feel there is not enough time for us to deliberate because a lot of information has been given. So it, it very clearly says that the permission of the chairman is required and it's not his permission alone. All the majority of the directors present at the meeting for even taking up the agenda. Otherwise, if some of the directors say this is too much and we need more time, then that has to be deferred. So it's made very clear there. What about shorter notice? That means less than seven days. Decisions taken at the meetings with shorter notice must have presence of at least one independent director if he is there. If not, what happens if there is no independent director If at the meeting, then what happens? You may take a decision, but it will be final only after it is ratified by at least one independent director. That means the minutes will have to be uh, you know, circulated to everybody, including the independent director. He has to ratify. Suppose there is no independent director, it has to be ratified by the majority. So you can see as though in boards, it's a democratic way of taking decisions. Uh, whenever there are circumstances like this, to make sure that there is complete disclosure and transparency and sufficient time is given, the law has provided that either the chairman and the majority directors have to consent. And if there's an independent director, he has to be uh, heard. Yes, Sarda, Sarda, I, would, yes. I would like to share one of the international experiences because I yes. happened to work in overseas countries for about three, four years. So there in the board meetings, the very first item after the chairman selection, quorum, etc., the item which is taken for the business purposes is the approval of the agenda item itself. Hmm. And also agree for any other item for discussion. That used to be the first item. It was actually a new thing for me when I mm. took up the job there. That when means I, uh, all the agenda items which are just because they are listed, uh, they may yeah. not be deliberated. Yeah. The members yeah. present there will have to yeah. agree what that will, this is what yeah, will what will the chairman will ask actually, have you received all the papers? Are we ready for discussion? Can this agenda can be approved? Or any agenda item used to be deferred or anything is there? That is the very beginning. He will check out first. Then the board members have to agree what the agenda is approved actually, then the next question will ask the company secretary, is there any other item which has been brought? So these are the items are there. Then you will ask the members also, would any of you like to discuss any other item you want to bring at this particular meeting? Then that is also agreed prior to the start of the meeting itself. Then it is recorded actually. The agenda item has been approved or any item is deferred, deferred. And these are the additional items which has been discussed with the permission of the chair, which has been also approved. That is the way it was there. It was actually one of the good practices which I noticed in overseas companies. I agree. I think it will also help, uh, you know, assessing what will be the time taken for conducting this meeting when you know what will be the agenda so that you are not taken by surprise that something is added at the end of the meeting. Oh, not only important. that, it was one more thing which also I noticed because what happens is in uh, Gulf countries, the Ramadan, Ramadan, what we call it, that has been done actually, the invariably the board meeting used to take place only after 8 o'clock in the night. Mm. Meeting used to be convened at 8 o'clock in the night, it used to go up to 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. So from that perspective, they will say, as you rightly said, we will not have that time, we will have to close the meeting, because right. next day again our fast starts. So right. that helps during that period, for them. that also I noticed actually. Mm. Yeah. Now, what about additional agenda? I think this we have already discussed. He has brought in his international uh, perspective also. It can be considered. Uh, earlier, it used to be with the permission of the chair. It's very clear now. It is not only just the permission of the chair who can bring in any additional agenda. Uh, it also requires the <coughs> permission of the majority of the directors in the meeting. So chairman cannot decide this on his own. And it is final only when it is ratified by the majority directors of the company, <clears throat> unless they were present at the meeting. These are the small nuances. Uh, when you want to make sure that the agenda has been introduced properly, the due process has been followed, and uh, this is properly minuted. It's uh, important to note that proper meeting notices to be sent to all the directors, like I said, including the original directors, if there are resolutions, anything passed without uh, proper notice, irregular notice, can be declared as not valid and this could lead to a lot of disputes. Kushbu is asking the seven day date of sending and date of receiving notice included or otherwise. 
Yeah. It just says seven days notice. So we leave out the first day. If there's a meeting on the ninth, then we have to send it at least by first. So that there are seven days. Yeah, one day is to be left out. The sending day yeah. should be excluded, I think. Yeah. So receiving yeah. day should not be excluded. See, earlier it used to be two clear days before and after when it used to go by post. But now it's all through email. Can shorter notice be given same day of the meeting? I think if majority of the directors agree, it can be given. Uh, that, that's what I said. I didn't say shorter notice means whether two days, three days. It can be even, you know, with one hour. In private company, a good practice. Small, they, small companies, you want to have a meeting urgently, that can be done. Yeah, they do it actually. In many of the companies, I also seen it. It is possible. So what we also do is while it's not prescribed, we also take a consent from them, you know, through an email or in the letter format. We take a consent with the signatures of the directors that they have no objection to this. No, in fact, what I used to do is I used to actually prepare the consent letter from the director itself in a yes. format. So during the meeting, I tell them, you sign this uh, consent for the agreement of the shorter notice. I used to get it signed, keep it in the record. Correct. Okay, now we are moving to board meetings. This is uh, already uh, known to company secretaries that in a calendar year, the gap should not be more than 120 days. It is uh, important to note that adjourned meeting also should be conducted within 120 days gap. Sharda, so, uh, Sharda one minute. No, stay. It is already 12.30. Yes. So what I request yes. you is what I request you is the uh, the things what is uh, well known to everyone. How many meetings? Okay. What is the dates fine, and all? Fine, fine, fine. That you may just you know uh, take. Up with I the will. Space I will highlight only. And the issues. and highlight the critical issues whatever are there. Okay. Correct. And we Correct. may extend it by about half an hour, forty minutes at the most. You know, twelve, maybe one thirty or one forty. Because we have to take up some questions also, and that's why what I request you is focus upon only the critical issues. Okay. And right. what I suggest that uh, we will not now intervene. We all and only uh, chat box will be utilized. No, now you you uh, Sarda can always talk. That is not the issue. But we all will be prepared so that we will able to conclude. Right. Okay. We now already what... use chat box. <laughs> Okay, what about committee meetings? Now we have talked of board meeting frequency. Normally what happens in the committees, when the committees are formed, the charter itself says, you know, how many times they should meet. If it is not mentioned in that, then you go back to the committees when they start their first meeting, they can decide about the number of meetings. Otherwise the board will decide. Now independent directors, we know that at least once in a calendar year, they have to meet. The guidance note also talks about what is the role of a company secretary. So there, they can hold their meeting by themselves. Sometimes they ask the company secretary to facilitate. That facilitation can happen. They can take minutes. Otherwise, they can do it by themselves. Now we are looking at quorum. This is already known. Uh, it may be useful to see what. how do you calculate this quorum. Now for calculating the total strength for quorum, make sure that the vacant position, for example, if there are about nine directors, two of them, uh, positions are not filled, that there are only seven. Then you look at uh, the quorum for seven and you also move out in interested directors who are not to be counted. Then and the net number that you have should be a valid quorum. Now, AOE can provide for a higher quorum. For example, you have nominee directors, investor directors, you know, JV partner directors. It says one from each party has to be present minimum. It is not enough that you just have one third or two. So make sure that you check the articles and uh, make sure that that kind of a quorum is present. Now, interested director is not to be counted for quorum, but for uh, private limited companies, uh, this ex exception was given. They can participate. They can vote. They can also be counted for quorum after disclosure of interest. Uh, whether participating through electronic mode, yes, they can be present and I mean, they can be counted for quorum. Now, what happens if there's an alternate director, if he is to be treated as interested, then he is not entitled to vote because if he is attending the meeting, because he himself is interested. Suppose the original director is, is interested and the alternate director is not interested. Then you can allow the alternate director to participate. He can be counted for quorum and vote. Sudhakar, would you like to add anything else here? The thing is that you know somebody asked me recently one question that uh, they have appointed an alternate director. Mm. After appointment of the alternate director, the agenda and everything went to the original director also, and he attended that meeting in a virtual mode. Mm. 
okay so in that meeting what happened with the original direct clause i attended the alternate direct clause i attended whose presence is to be counted for that purpose the answer to that question is the alternate director will cease to be a director only when the original director returns to the country. returns to the country yes in this case he has not returned only he is attending the meeting in a virtual mode so for all purposes the alternate director's presence is to be counted for the purpose of quorum his voting only will be uh, will, will be taken into account as far as the original director is concerned his presence will be recorded as if he is an invitee only inviting yeah, that's what i was he's thinking he is not attending that meeting as a director this is yeah. what the clarity i have thought of so, giving it to the no no uh, i think see these are some sensitive matters for a company secretary sometimes they may feel why am i being shown as a invitee so it becomes a responsibility of the company secretary to clearly explain the provisions you know we are not denying his directorship or his right to attend but then how this has to be minuted becomes very important and we have a role to play we should have clarity ourselves and make sure that it is minuted accordingly <clears throat> disclosures i think i don't have to uh, mention anything here if all directors are interested in a board meeting what happens obviously the matter will have to go to the general meeting ss2 has to be followed now quorum requirements for committee i have already mentioned Uh, if it is, it has to be specified either under the Act or the AOA or any other law, for example, which requires forming of the committee. If not, all the members they have to be present. Now adjournment very clearly. You now there is clarity on this. If there is a lack of quorum, it gets adjourned to the same day, time, and place next week. Now in that adjourned meeting also, if there is no quorum, then the meeting gets. cancelled it has put to rest lot of uh, issues which used to come up earlier whether it can get adjourned again and in many times we see in investor agreements also they are trying to put something else contractually you can have a different uh, provision but the law is very clear that it gets cancelled now this is adjournment on account of lack of quorum but for any other reason can the a meeting can a board meeting be adjourned a uh, chairman can also adjourn a meeting for any reason at any stage that means the meeting has started at agenda number 4 he can adjourn or he can uh, say that at the end of it he can say that some particular agenda itself is not going to be taken but he cannot do it on his own the, it's very clear that unless majority directors at the meeting disagree to the same that means the consent of the majority directors has to be taken before he decides to adjourn a meeting he cannot do it on his own i think lot of mischief which was happening in the past uh, has got arrested thanks to some of these provisions now attendance at meeting this is quite procedural maybe i will skip but it is important that this attendance sheet or attendance book whatever you have they have to be every page has to be initialed the chairman has to sign if it is a electronic meeting then uh, at least we mentioned that they have all participated through vc roll call has to be taken at the end of it the chairman will have to authenticate that these are the only signatures nothing else can be inserted in between and attendance register is an important part of the uh, you know board documents it can be kept open for inspection not only by the directors but also by the auditors officers of any roc or any other uh, regulatory body yeah now leave of absence so on our own we can't say that uh, you know leave of absence is granted it it has to be granted only when sought specifically make sure that the director who is absent is communicating clearly that he is absent and he is do, uh, requesting for loa if not he is liable to vacate office if he has not attended for the last 12 months after the last meeting that he has attended then this is the reason for vacation of office so it is important that loa is granted at his request now what happens when there is a vacation because of this is a board resolution required it says it is an automatic the moment that you know the last meeting he should have attended he has not attended in a period of 12 months he vacates office we can go ahead and file the dir at 12 however as a good practice intimation at least has to be sent to the director and board should be taking note of it in the next meeting that's the practical aspect moving to secretary standard 5 this is all relating to chairman now 
chairman of the company shall be the chairman of the board sometimes in the articles it's very clearly mentioned that so and so person is a chairman so and so person will be the managing director or in the first meeting it's very clearly said that so and so is appointed as a chairman if <clears throat> there's a difference between chairman of the company and he is only a chairman of the board if nothing is mentioned uh, you know one of the directors will be elected every meeting that will be the first item election of chairman if the chairman is interested in any item of the agenda what should he do he should hand over the meeting to any disinterested director only for such item and if if required he can thereafter resume as chairman thereafter so these are things uh, you know depending on the disclosures that we have already received we should as company secretaries advise the chairman sometimes you know they continue to uh, uh, chair the meeting we should very politely intervene and say you are interested in this item kindly refrain from chairing and can we have somebody else so these are things it is our responsibility as company secretaries to make sure that these are complied you are absolutely right actually in case of the annual general meeting the chairman being a non executive director he is actually liable for retire by rotation when his own item of the election comes actually he should not conduct that particular item he should ask another director to chair the meeting and then once he is elected then he can actually revert back and he can start conducting the meeting correct so one of the primary responsibilities of a chairman is to safeguard the integrity of the vc meeting and ensure compliance of procedures i think each company will have to come up with their own process how they are going to do that but integrity of the vc meeting is we have to follow the process the roll call who is speaking who is, everybody should be allowed to speak they should be heard out they should be able to see each other so any lapses in any of this can uh you know the whole meeting can decisions taken can be questioned so that is one of the primary responsibilities and company secretary has to facilitate the chairman in that articles can provide tenures for the chairman <clears throat> especially if there are any uh, jv companies they always say for example there is an alternating uh, period of 2 years somebody will be present from this uh, jv partner 2 years from this jv partner or you know five years in a row so and so person will be there 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 could be different tenures mentioned so please remember to check the articles and uh, chairman has a second or casting vote unless otherwise provided in the aoa which means the aoa can provide that he doesn't have otherwise by default he will have a casting vote now in in case of rpt interested chairman cannot be present at the meetings sudhakar do you want to add anything here no no not here chairman yeah now committee meetings also as i said the board will actually normally when the board is constituted so, sorry committee is constituted they give the terms of reference they also uh, identify a person one of them to be the chairman and of course in sebi lodr you know who can be a chairman who cannot be chairman we should keep all that in mind else the committee will be electing one of them as a chairman and within 5 minutes if the chairman is not present then anybody who is present at the meeting can chair the meeting i am moving to circular resolutions we use this circular resolution for decision making of the board so very often uh, it's very very important aspect of decision making and the guidance note is quite extensive on this i have just picked up few points uh, resolutions which are passed by circulation are deemed to be passed as if they are as good as the board has met and decided that is the authority which they have as if it's at a board meeting now all items of business may be considered for passing a circulation except a few items please refer to the guidance note very clearly it is given which are the general items which are the specific items which cannot be uh, passed through circulation now again if some director like he is asking for a meeting to be held similarly if he suggests that we should take a decision and it should be done through circular resolution so who has the authority normally it is the chairman or the managing director or any other director who is not interested in that item so it's our responsibility to make sure who is requesting for this and what kind of guidance we give now circular resolution should be approved by majority of the directors entitled to vote so again leave out all the disinterested directors but this has a rider i am bringing it up now when is it going to be considered as passed it is deemed as passed on the last day of the assembly normally we say 7 days available beyond 7 days it lapses 
Sometimes if it's urgent, we can also say within three days, kindly pass this. So look at what is the last date of the ascent by the directors or the date on which ascent from more than two thirds. So it is just not simple majority. It is two thirds of the directors. They should give an ascent for this resolution. This is very important. Now, ascent or decision. Sorry, sorry, like sorry, sorry, sorry. One minute, Sharda. Two thirds of the directors need not give the ascent. More than two thirds of the directors have to vote for, and majority has to give the assent. No, but it also says if not less than one third require a meeting, CR cannot be passed. That's what I said. That's what I told yeah. you. No, that's what yeah. I told you. More than two thirds they have to vote for. Correct. That means what? They, those people have voted. Now they don't. They can't call for a physical board meeting. Correct. 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 One third plus only they do it. And now that what happened? Out of the two third people. More than two thirds have casted their vote, either assent or dissent they have given. Correct. Majority assents, if they are there, out of that lot, then the resolution is passed. So For example, saying... if a company if a company is having said nine directors, mm -hmm. seven directors have given their assent or dissent by the third day. The company has given seven days' time. Seven directors have uh, as given assent or dissent on the third day itself. That means what? The remaining two directors cannot insist for a board meeting. Correct. Because two thirds like, is already uh, voted and they have uh, approved yes. the decision. So then what happened is more than two thirds have voted. Out of that, seven directors, four have given the assent, three have given their dissent. Mm -hmm. So majority of the resolution is prevailed. So it is resolution passed on the third day of the circular yes. this thing, not on the seventh day there. Correct, correct. So anyway, this particular aspect has been give very appropriately yes, dealt yes. with in the guidance thought with examples also. Yeah, illustrations so, are uh, there. Uh, illustrations also. So kindly go through that. If the clarity is there very much. Yes. And if there is no response received by any director, then he is deemed that he is abstained from the voting. Correct? That's what we have to assume. Now, how should the circular resolution be passed? Just like notice all the necessary papers. If you have, there are any annexures to be circulated, everything has to be circulated either by hand, speed post, registered post. But invariably today, email is the mode through which uh, we are circulating the circular resolution papers. Now, if there's an alternate director, just like the notice of uh, the meeting, the draft should be sent to both original director for information and also for the alternate director to give his, to vote on that. Proof of sending has to be maintained. So one important point to note is circular resolution shall not dispense with the requirement for the board to meet. That means four times in a year it has to meet within a period of 120 days. Just because you have taken decisions through a circular resolution, that does not you know, uh, do away with the requirement to hold the board meeting. It is only one board in which the board can take decisions for emergent matters. Now, resolutions which are passed by circulation, obviously, they have to be noted at the next meeting. And if there is any dissent, that also, or any abstention, that also has to be noted. It's very important that see for what happens in a board meeting is at least if you do not understand something, the board can ask some questions, they can be clarified. But in a circular resolution, everything is happening in a written format. So it is the responsibility of the company secretary to gather all the information, give a good preamble explain all the proposals, give the highlights, make sure that there is enough material for the board member to take decisions. He may also come back and ask for any clarifications. I'm moving to minutes. Uh, many of the points, I think minutes are so important that right at the beginning of this program, there were many uh, important uh, experiences which have been shared by Sudhakar Bala and Deepthi also, but I, I'll just pick up a few. Minutes have been dealt with extensively in uh, guidance note. It's uh, Secretarial Standard 7 guidance note has maximum coverage. So I would urge all the participants to look at that. No restriction in law. So while English is the business language, if the board members uh, are, you know, promoters who are not comfortable in English, they can also, if, if the company secretary is able to help them, you can have, uh, you can record uh, the minutes in any other language as well. Now it has to be well drafted. This was highlighted by Sudhakar, and this is where we see when we go for secretarial audit. Also, the quality of drafting is quite pathetic. Many company secretaries just convert the agenda, which is there, past tense. Including the heading, I have seen it was quite uh, shocking to see somebody just uh, converting the agenda heading also into past tense. And they feel 
whatever is there in the agenda, you use the past tense, it becomes uh, minutes, which is not the case. Please give the preamble. Summary of the discussions is very important because the process, the journey is as important as the destination. I mean, the outcome of this decisions. So a summary of the discussions have to be given. In some meetings, I have seen some of the uh, board members, they say, please call out the names and say who said what. Sometimes they say, don't call out anything, just give the highlights of the discussions. But what is discussed and what is the rationale which has led to a particular decision, that is more important. And like we said, this. Uh, you know, minutes have to be kind of a speaking order. Now, especially views of directors, independent directors, especially has to be recorded, especially if they have a dissent. Now, minutes should state that decision under any other item has been, we also saw in the agenda that if you want to introduce any other ad additional agenda, the majority of the directors also have to consent. Otherwise, in the end, it, in the minutes, it has to be stated that it is ratified. Now, it's, as a good practice, it is good to start, for example, you combine all the minutes, agenda items, which are there for noting, which are there for record, which are there for discussions, which are there for approvals, then it becomes more structured and uh, an efficient way of conducting the meetings. Mm -hmm. All appointments should be specifically minuted, whether it is of directors, KMP, senior managers, auditors, mm -hmm. this has to be specifically minuted. Now, decisions which are recorded in the form, it can be in the form of resolutions where it is statutorily required. In other cases, it can also be recorded in a narrative form. But uh, especially if you want to approve some documents, I would say uh, use these resolutions. Minutes shall be signed by the chairman of that particular meeting within the 30 days period. I mean, uh, we are not within 30 days period, but uh, it has to be approved within 30 days. I have a slide for that but it should be signed by that chairman or it can also be signed by the chairman of the next meeting. So guidance note is uh, clarifying a lot of these issues uh, where people would have doubts about this. Every page has to be initialed. We are aware of this. A page has to be signed. Now scanned signature, is it permitted? In my opinion, it is not. Uh, it has to be original signature. Otherwise, you can use a digital signature, but be mindful of the timestamp which is coming on that. Who can inspect minutes that is one of the questions which has been uh, queries which have been answered yeah directors can inspect the minutes of the meeting which are held before his directorship suppose you get an offer to become a director of a company though you were not present in the previous meetings you can ask that i want to inspect the minutes i want to know about the company now, after he ceases to be a director also, he can ask, but the last meeting, for example, which he has attended, he can ask for a copy of the minutes. Now, uh, the guidance note prescribes that as a matter of good governance, ask, ask for a formal application. That means the director has to formally request. This is all in the interest of the company secretary. Why did you give out the minutes or why did you allow somebody to inspect? Then very clearly we have a request and if required, wherever required, especially if they are coming on board newly or if they are moving out, ask for an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. There could be a lot of uh, critical matters, you know, which are uh, sensitive matters, which are always there as part of the board minutes. These are some of the nuances which have been very well highlighted in the guidance note. Now, who can inspect the minutes? It's very clear, PCS, secretarial auditor, all of them can inspect the minutes. Member of a company, a shareholder is not entitled, which is to inspect the minutes of the meeting, unless it is stated in the AOA. Sometimes I've seen in, in investor representatives, investor uh, uh, JV partners, sometimes it's very specifically called out in the articles that they can have access to the minutes and any other official records of the company. Finally, it is the chairman's responsibility to ensure fair and accurate summary. Because what has to go in, what should not go in, he has the prerogative and, but it cannot be very arbitrary. And that is where the test of the chairmanship comes in. It has to be fair and accurate. Yeah, Shanda, um, uh, I, would, yeah. Uh, I would like to add uh, a few things, you know, in this Please. minutes thing, we can, before the circulation, you go there. Yeah. This yeah. previous slide. See, here, first and foremost thing is that it is the responsibility of the chairman to uphold the integrity of the minutes. And it is the responsibility of the company secretary to uphold the confidentiality of the minutes. And 
second thing is how it is to be drafted also to a large extent sectoral standards have taken pains to explain it it should be right in yeah, what's called as you know in the past tense the third party all those things you know right the only thing what is important is that resolution the way it is there in the agenda the resolution is to be recorded in the minutes you cannot alter it even comma full stop also you are not supposed to alter that because why i am specifying this thing is with all due regards many of the company secretaries doesn't know that the preamble what is there in the agenda when you are giving it that is that uh, you can say the the commentary or the notes to the context. resolution whatever we pardon context i said context, context yeah, yeah whatever we give it that when you convert it into the minutes as a preamble that point of time obviously it should be there in the past tense on the third party but as far as the resolution is concerned the way you have proposed the resolution the directors have approved it so that's why you cannot change that resolution in any way you have to just verbatim you have to print it if at all the resolution is to be modified or amended you have to go back to the board again get it approved and then only you can do that then question comes this uh, as sharda has rightly mentioned the directors of the company have the right to inspect the minutes of the board meeting but if a director says that my chartered accountant will come and inspect the minutes it will not be permitted correct it is only the director who has the right he cannot say ki by my proxy or somebody will come and then he will do the inspection or not it will not be permitted then question comes the pcs secretary auditor statutory auditor and all these people are having the right i cannot take it as the inspection it, they have a right to to look into the minutes they can see the minutes question comes can they ask for the copies of the copies. minutes according to me they have no right to ask for the copies of the minutes at the most they may ask for the certified copy of the resolutions wherever it will enable them to ensure their authenticity of their audit and all they but entire minutes in total they have no right to ask that is what the view we have taken because in some auditors were asking us you give the copies of the minutes you know because sometimes it may so happen that you don't want to give the preamble to them how what is the pcs or anybody they are concerned with whenever there is a uh, peer review takes place that point of time they have to also insulate themselves for certain things so resolutions are important for them not the preamble and also total copy of the minutes need not be given to the uh, i mean sharda i don't know whether uh, what kind of view you you may take it as a pcs and all but this is what according to me the i don't think that we have dealt with that much clarity in the guidance note as such i don't think we have mentioned this thing but this yeah. is a view in in our house at least we have taken the view like that but as secretary question... auditor sudhakar when we yes. go if they give only resolutions correct okay, that's okay, what okay. is yeah the, but the thing is when we want to uh, when we are required to comment on whether they have due process in 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 this board meeting due process is followed i feel Uh, we should have access to the minutes because it's not just looking at access. the resolution you should also look at the preamble and the rationale i, I, I no 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 one minute one minute one minute let me tell you you have a right to have the access to the minutes please go through the minutes you can read the minutes but you have no right to ask for the copy of the minutes certified copy of the entire minutes right from the word mm -hmm. a to z mm -hmm. do i need do i am duty bound to give it to any statute or only regulatory authority if they ask i have i have no option but to give it to them but others are concerned it enables them to complete their audit to form an opinion and to give their audit mm. report for that i don't need to give the copies because in one of the cases what happened was uh, the statute auditors was insisting for one company correct that we need to have the entire minutes we said no we will not give that thing. then this question we have examined thoroughly and the view was like that so that just to add one point uh, bala before because you were maybe were mentioning about the certified true copy so i think guidance note also talks about this saying that when you can give out the so it is better as a good practice if you already propose the resolution in the agenda then the same thing will be there in the minutes so even before the minutes are completed if <coughs> something is proposed as a resolution in the agenda then you can give it out as a certified true copy else you will have to wait for the minutes so it is better that you draft whatever you want in the agenda itself Yes. Sir. In, in fact, I had a hell of a lot of uh, problems when I was dealing with uh, some of the big four companies in the company. Because, as you rightly say, 
the big four companies, the senior partner, he deputy the article clerk, he says that he will go through the minutes, you show the minutes. I refused mm -hmm. to do so. The matter actually went to our board. It was deliberated. Chairman told very categorically, no minutes will be shown to any of the article clerk, etc. Another thing and done. It will be shown only to the signing partner. That is the one thing, very clearly. Second thing, entire minutes will not be shown to you. What is relevant for your audit purposes, that only will be shown to you. Only the certified copy will be given to you. This decision we have taken, actually, we have been adhering that in a listed company where I was working. But in practice, in some of the companies, I have about five years of the experience working with the private companies and unlisted public companies. In practice, what Sudhagar says is, give the copy of the minutes, the entire copy of the minutes, says some more other, ah, they know. It is something like that. No, no, this tussle, this tussle always from people in employment and people in practice is always uh, there because for us, if you are selective in that, it is difficult for us. And in most private companies, uh, you know, when we go for uh, secretary audit, whether it's listed also, they are giving it to the team also. No, otherwise, yeah, because the team is what is looking at the I, audit. I know, I but know. But it's an individual pra I think, practice yeah, I of the know. company. That is what yeah, the please, please remember that. Please remember that several times okay we are we do certain things without application of mind in the day to day course unless until some kind of issues arise out of that Correct. the seriousness will not be there true even it was there prior to that even in my own company also we used to give the minutes like that but in one mm -hmm. particular there where the sensitivity was there we felt that mm -hmm. it is not to be given mm -hmm. then the auditor also thought that are all these years i am getting it why not mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. So there was an issue has cropped up that point of time. Then we were to examine it in detail and we said, no, it is like. Actually, further, one more thing also I would like to add that is the inspection of the minutes by the directors. If you see the act is completely silent about it. Correct. In fact, this is the greatest of the greatest thing which helped the directors as far as secretary standard is concerned, as you are rightly mentioned, they have a right to inspect the minutes of the previous meetings before their date of join. Several times it used to happen earlier. The moment as a director, if I join the board and ask for the previous uh, minutes of the board meetings, the company secretary go and ask the chairman or the MD, sir, the new director is asking for the minutes. And sometimes, you know, okay, what that uh, the chairman used to say, what is your view, Mr. Company Secretary? And he to mm -hmm. go to score the brownie points, he used to say, sir, let us not show him, you know, they're very confidential. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Right, when you are inviting a person to join your board, where is the question of confidentiality? If you are keeping that also confidential from him, then why you are appointing him as a director? So, secretary standard, we are taking a very cautious view that the director, the moment you appoint him, he has a right to review the minutes of the previous minutes also. Because he, if he has to understand the culture of the organization, how the meetings take place and all yes. these things, this will be helpful to him. But yes, no doubt about it. If he's asking by, I want copies of all the minutes and all, then something is wrong there. Mm. You have to ask for the purpose for which he is doing it. We are not telling that, but don't ask for the purpose. Just show it to him, whatever he wants. No, it is not like that. No doubt about it, that it is the company secretary within his prerogative. He can ask the new director, sir, would, what would you like to see exactly there? And he, the director has to give the purpose. He cannot arrogantly say, how the, how the hell you are concerned with? No, he has to give the purpose also. And then, of course, company secretary also, he should not just show it to him everything. He has to seek the permission of the chairman or MD, whoever it is, and then do it. Second question comes that the moment I direct, I, I am ceasing to be a director. And suppose a litigation is going on against me. For that purpose, I want to refer to the minutes. And most of the companies used to refuse that because you are no more a director. You have no right to inspect the minutes of the company. Because... As per the act, only the director has the right to inspect. You are not a director today. Then this gentleman has to go to the court and ask the court to summon for the minutes and to produce him a copy of the minutes. There is a round robin thing used to happen. Again, here in the secretary standard, it is clearly the right has been given to the director. During the years in which he is a director, if you want to have inspect the minutes of those meetings, he has a right to do that. And he has also right to ask for certified copy of those minutes also. Anyway, apart from that thing, of course, you know that if, if I think your next slide, you are going to deal with the draft minutes are to be circulated within 15 days. Right. And the signed copy of the minutes are to be also circulated post signatures. That is also, according to me, a great boon 
as yes. far as the directors, especially independent directors are concerned. So that no uh, kind of any alterations or fudging and all will take place in the future. Balan, Go ahead, sir. Uh, I Balan, think this sir, is put to... Balan, sir, in this kind of situation, I can understand the legal position. We generally, we have been asked, you know, what is the legal position? But I also feel many times there is a ethics, corporate values and best practices. Three things are there underlying. Ultimately, the spirit of the standards are also only underlying on these things. So... Uh, we have to be very care careful when we are applying all those things. Yes, they have a certain position, they just stretch rotate and all those things. So I also feel that three things should be also factored when you are responding of these kind of uh, your business partners or your internal team. No, uh, true. That's why I see. We, uh, while the guidance note is quite extensively dealing with a lot of things, that there are so many other issues which can come up. It is not a kind of encyclopedia that for every query you have an answer there. So there are guidance given there and uh, whatever three underlying elements which you mentioned, they are important. I think and that's the corporate culture which uh, you know each company will be building in. Okay, circulation of minutes, I think Idea it's quite the clear. Auditors who are, we are appointing only for the interest of the corporate values or for our best practices and in fact it's not that just they are auditing they add some values for the business if suppose we are missing something they suggest also so they are also one of the important part so as far as disclosure and uh, information uh, that has to be very carefully discussed and with the internal team and then thereafter we can respond with the underlying uh, regulations or uh, our obligations right so this is just uh, using an illustration. It's quite clearly there and a lot of questions, queries relating to, you know, who should sign and if the previous director is not, chairman is not there, who will be signing the next meeting? Can you sign? All these things are dealt with in the guidance note. I'm moving to uh, sectoral standard Sharda, 8. Before, uh, Sharda, before you move it further, one more thing also is there that the previous minutes are to be placed at the next meeting and to be circulated noting. along with the next agenda, okay, for noting purpose. Always a question used to come that, say, for example, the board meeting has taken place on 1st of February. The Another board meeting has taken place on 8th of February. The minutes of the 1st of February have not been finalized. How can they be placed for the purpose of noting at the 8th meeting? Mm -hmm. Most of the uh, the company secretaries in those days, they used to ask this particular question. And even now also, I think some uh, kind of a confusion is there. To clarify that point, it is very clear that you have a right a time to record the minutes of 30 days. Yes. So in case your second board meeting is taking place on 8th of February, you don't need to place the minutes of the 1st February meeting before the board. Absolutely correct. The Absolutely first correct. Board, July, uh, sorry, the February 1st meeting and February 8th meeting, you can place it together at the next board meeting. Correct. You're right. Absolutely. And similarly, right. the question also arises that who can sign these two minutes? These two minutes can be signed by the respective chairmen or alternately, the next meeting chairman also Chair. can sign the previous two board minutes. Correct. Yeah. In, in fact, many of the private companies, what is happening where I worked with it, as soon as the minutes, etc., the other things are all finalized after the approval of the 22nd days or something like that. What they used to do is they used to take the signature of the chairman who chaired the meeting of that. That's all they used to do it on the next time when he circulated the minute, they said the minute, minutes are already signed by the earlier chairman. Many companies, they have been following that. Because they and don't the want to keep sir, it. Uh, Bala, sir, the thing is like this, you know, these are all the practical rigmaroles we all are aware of which we are doing it. Correct. The purpose of this kind of webinar is to understand that whenever a tricky question comes, yeah. suppose say for example that chairman of these two meetings expired. Now the question comes, can the meeting of the third meeting, the chairman of the third can meeting sign? can sign <clears throat> these two minutes? That answer to that is, so this kind of tricky questions when they come, then only the issues will, I mean, okay, come out. Say for example, just like we were mentioning Earlier, the, the, since the law was silent, prior to that, in fact, under the 56 Act, when the director of the new joinee, if asked for the previous minutes, can he ask for that? We used to say, no, he has no right to ask for that. Maybe rightly so, because that was the interpretation which was taken, because the law was silent about it. When the secondary standards are come into picture, that point of time, these ambiguities, wherever the law is silent, 
those issues have been addressed and fortunately since it is a part of law now you can very well say by he got a legal right in all respects in fact when this uh, lot of commotion was there in the beginning uh, on the ss1 some of my own directors in my company asked what is this controversy about secretarial standards why they are there when the companies act is their rules are there why over and above these secretarial standards so we could explain to them what is the reason for that at the same point of time we also told them that independent directors especially and directors in general they got immensely benefited and at the same point of time let me also take liberty of saying this even the key managerial persons the secretarial auditors the financial auditors all have been insulated from any kind of wrong things happening because of the board meetings which are very very important and if anything goes wrong we all will be in trouble yeah so sudhakar uh, this point i was just wondering uh, like you took an example of you know the chairman of the next meeting signing because either these two meeting the chairmen they could have also resigned without signing the previous or they have passed away but Correct. do you say is it his duty to sign or he can sign can he refuse to sign See, saying for example he yes, was yes, not yes, he See, was technically so they had lot no, of he, issues which yeah, were yeah, there yeah i got i got your point what i want to say is whether he is duty bound answer is if the law says he can sign it mm. suppose for whatever the reasons it is if he refuses to sign mm. it is the board to take the decision mm. and board may authorize some xyz to sign the minutes also those who were not the chairman chair. okay yeah those they were not chairman because the chairman is refusing Correct. the chairman of the next meeting is refusing for whatever the reasons it is but you cannot just leave it like that either he is to Correct. be convinced that but by what is the problem for you to sign it the board mm -hmm. has to convince him or alternately if he is so adamant about that thing for whatever the reasons it is say for example he might be an interested party in that Mm. he may say look i want to recuse from the decisions taken from that particular meeting mm. i have recused myself i don't want to sign the minutes though i am a chairman of this meeting and correctly so so that point of time the board can authorize somebody else yes. and that other person will sign the minutes because there is a uh, what's called as you know uh, practical difficulty is there because that chairman was resigned or chairman has been expired or whatever the correct thing. Yeah. so recording uh, these circumstances and and these decisions are very important in the minutes why something is being yeah. signed by somebody else okay i have come to secretarial standards 8 which is relating to preservation of minutes and other records uh, it shall be in the custody of the company secretary or if there is no company secretary it's with the authorized director permanently to be maintained in physical or electronic form with time stamp now what about notice agenda and other uh, documents which go along with that they should be maintained either for eight financial years or as long as they remain relevant for example you know there is some litigation going on then it is important till it is disposed of even after the appeal you may require all this so you have to be mindful of that and uh, otherwise it can be destroyed with the approval of the board that is i am talking of only notice and agenda somebody has asked actually how long you know to maintain the video recording video recording i think uh, uh, what uh, i understand is at least till the audit is completed because it is clearly given in the rules it is clearly yeah. given in the rules itself it is not no, no need to refer to standards it is clearly given in the rules itself as sharda has rightly mentioned okay now all other documents uh, which they may be destroyed after 8 years with the approval of the board and the central government in case of amalgamation this is uh, you know some basic points which are there relating to preservation of minutes and records now disclosure is another important thing it has to be disclosed in the board's report that uh, there should be a statement that all the secretarial standards which are applicable to this company are complied with so we do include it as a part of the statement and 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 under, under director's responsibility statement this specific paragraph has been added the directors have devised proper systems now the secretarial standards really help in making sure that the directors have devised proper systems to ensure compliance with all the applicable standards and that systems are adequate and operating effectively it is a, a very very important responsibility that the board is uh, cast with 
In fact, one I'm more thing also I would like to mention about that minutes part, you know, when I, I'm sure that you have mentioned about it, the signed copy of the minutes are to be circulated to all the directors within 15 days of signing that minutes. Correct. 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 There, Correct. what happened was in that, uh, before revising the SS1 in 17, there were a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, representations have received that uh, considering the sensitivity of the minutes, is it mandatory to circulate it or can we take a waiver? So mm -hmm. then that is clearly provided that the board may take, uh, the directors may give a waiver that they don't want to have the certified copy of the signed minutes of the board meetings. Mm -hmm. If that waiver is there, then you don't need to circulate it. If the waiver is not there, you have to sign, you have to circulate the signed copy of the board minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Penalty for non-compliance with secretarial standard is part of 118. So if there is a default, there's a penalty which can be levied both on the company, uh, which is 25,000 plus the officer in default. Now, here I'm sure uh, Bala sir uh, has written many articles. I think almost every adjudication order which is being passed uh, immediately, you know, there is a full analyzing that there's an article by him. But I have just captured a few things just to highlight that somebody was talking about business model and compliance. Please see that it is not either or while you have to. Uh, do your business, whether in India or abroad, there is no two ways about compliance. Look at the uh, kind of costs which are levied, penalties which are levied both on the directors and the company for some very, you may think it's a very silly thing, non-maintenance of minutes or failing to serially number the attendance register. Even for that, there has been a penalty which is uh, levied. This was a few months back. If you open the MCA portal, there are a number of adjudication orders Bangalore ROC is very active. Ahmedabad is active. Even Coimbatore, a small place like Coimbatore, every small thing, it is picked up. So I think uh, using AI, this is only going to increase because most of these ROCs, their functions have changed. They are no more uh, you know, approving anything. Most of it is an STP or there's going to be a, a central repository, a central reg the center which is going to be created, which was announced in the budget also. So they may move all these functions there and they have more time. They have uh, access to all these data they're able to analyze. So this is the importance of very strictly following secretarial standards. And I would uh, request Professor Bala to maybe highlight a couple of uh, cases. No, no. In fact, what happens was in case of the India Bulbs Real Estate Limited, the company which is actually based in uh, Gurgaon, the Delhi ROC has actually passed an order. If you actually go through the order, it is really speaking, not maintaining the attendance register serial wise for each of the meetings. On that order, not only the company has been penalized and directors have been penalized, even the company secretary and as of the CFO, both being a KMP, they were also actually penalized in this particular case. Because they said it is a responsibility of the KMP to include the records. They have included the CFO also in this particular case. In many cases, if you see, Directors actually left out. It is only the company and company secretary. They are actually being penalized, taking the view the company secretary is fully responsible for compliances. In fact, it is also very evident because we discussed in the earlier seminar also that in case of the Madras Fertilizers case, initially what happens for all the non compliance of the secretary standard and the ROC has passed an order penalizing the company and the directors, but the company felt the Penalty is high, they made an appeal to the RD. But what happens is RD is very categorically spelled out. One the whole time company secretary is actually appointed for the company, it is only the responsibility of the company secretary to ensure the provisions of the company act rules and as well as the secretary standard. And the company secretary alone is responsible for the compliances. In view of that, he set aside the entire order passed by the ROC he actually remanded back the order to the ROC back with the direction, please initiate separate action on company secretary and company secretary alone. This is the classic case. So in which case now more and more realization is actually coming that company secretary, that means we are the people who are responsible for this particular function as rightly envisaged in section 205 of the company act. So we need to be very careful, especially when it comes to the private companies, unlisted public companies and small companies and all those things, it's a care has to be taken. And where the company secretaries are not there, in which case the secretary standard will certainly help 
either to the authorized persons or to the director, because some of the companies I know, the one of the director himself is actually taking the responsibility of ensuring the compliance. This will definitely greatly help to those people to ensure the things and to reduce the litigations and avoid the penal actions. I would just like to add that if you think these orders are only against big companies, no, all small private companies, you know, if somebody has not put the website in the address, SIN number is not mentioned in the letter read, all those things are getting picked up and most of them are unlisted and private limited companies, which are, you know, against which these adjudication orders are being passed. So perhaps it's also our responsibility, especially when we have practice, that to highlight and educate the promoters also the importance of this. Only when they see this, you know, it pinches them. But instead of coming to a stage where they have to pay, if we can create awareness, I'm sure seminars like this will also help. And sure. from my office, I have asked my trainees to take it up as an assignment, analyze this and put it in a simple form so that it is communicated to the promoters. Not only that, in fact, I think... Uh... Practicing company secretaries have a greater role to yes, play yes. because whenever they are actually carrying the secretary audit, etc., another thing and all, they can actually, you know, have a sort of a small presentation to the private companies in a group of people, etc., they educate them actually. In fact, not only that, OE, SIN number and other thing and all, not only that, there are a couple of cases where I come across, you know, financial statements, the DIN number of the directors are not mentioned on which the action has been taken some of the companies. That is one. And similarly, in one of the companies, I think the register office, uh, he made a visit actually, casually. The register of, register of company made a visit casually to the register office of the company. When he met the register office of the company, he just found the signboard is not there, which is required to be displayed. Spelling the register office address, detail, etc., other thing, and all itself, that was not there. It was not there. Then he told the, there's a violation. This is what it is. He told he issued the notice. And the company has actually come back. Company came back saying, no, 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 we all along maintain the sideboard, etc. and other thing and all. What happened? It caught the damage due to the heavy rain and storm, which occurred in a particular time. So we have to, have to set it. If it has happened in Northern India in bigger state, in a small place. So he said, I have to send it to the Patna, the to and fro traveling the time and sending it physically and getting it back, etc. It has taken almost about 20, 25 days time. And we have replaced it back. That is what he said actually. But the ROC has taken a stand. Anyway, non compliance is a non compliance during that period when I visited. So, what I am taking is the day I visited, there was a non compliance. The day you replied, you replaced it. During that period, I will penalize you. He has penalized actually that company. So, these are all very minor things, but at the same time, very important because unnecessarily, you know, companies' time get involved and money get involved and people have spent a lot of time sorting out the issues, etc. So, as you rightly put the awareness, this can be definitely brought, especially to educating the smaller companies and uh, private companies and unlisted public companies. Sir, in another case, I think you may have written an article also. Recently, it was in the groups that uh, one director for two different companies, he has signed on the same day, in two different places, signing the financial statement. So you, we can imagine to what extent they are going. So uh, while you may not be aware if the director has signed somewhere else, so we have, we have to be on our toes and create awareness. That's the message that's coming. Yeah, so definitely. I'll move on. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think this was something I, I just picked up saying in some two orders. Yeah, IBBI. Be, yeah, yeah. yeah, we are late. So I'll yeah. move on that even NCLAT order, IBBI order, there is reference. Our own professionals have been referring to SS and that has also been mentioned in the orders which has passed by these authorities. That's the importance which is uh, available to uh, these secretary standards. With this, formally, I, I will close this uh, presentation because I see there are about 48 messages in the chat. Perhaps you want to moderate those. Thank you. Yeah. I think in some of the things I already answered on the chat also. In the case of the small company, two board meeting can be held for the minimum time where shall be 90 days between the two meetings. So what if the director of the company are willing to discuss some agenda and convene the meeting before that 90 days gap? So if the board calls the meeting before that 90 days of the gap, if the board again calls the meeting before 90 days, so if it becomes necessary for the company to call third meeting or two meetings will work. Now see, calling the meeting is as per the need of the business. Because losses is a minimum, but you can have 
whatever the type of meeting you need as per the need of the business. But the time gap, what is mentioned, should be, should be actually maintained between the meeting. That is what it is recorded here. How many board meetings in one day are allowed? <laughs> How many board meetings in one day are allowed? Samir, what is in your mind? I am not very clear on that. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Very good afternoon. The, the thing is that uh, uh, as ma'am has suggested that uh, one can conduct a board meeting, convene a board meeting in a one day, given a shorter notice. Yeah. Given on a shorter notice, even on a one day, it's possible. So I just want to know because there was an incident like uh, like the, the, the same webinar I've been attending. Uh, one of the incidents in the webinar itself, where the example was given that uh, there are n number of board meetings conducted or convened. No, no, see, in that like kind this. of manner to pass that particular resolution, that it could be possible. No, no, no. See, there could be in a smaller companies it is possible because the thing is, you know what happened? There may be some meetings where the members' approval will be required. Okay, board has to recommend members have to approve. In what happens in many of the companies? The members and the directors are one and the same. So you take the item in the morning at 10 o'clock board meeting. After the board meeting gets over 11 o'clock, you convene the AGM and you take the approval. And after the, the implementation purposes, you can call another board meeting. That is actually possible. So it is not that you can conduct only one meeting or something like that. It is depending upon as per the need. If such situation comes, you can conduct. But mm -hmm. only thing is, as Sharda would exactly. say very clearly, Concern of the shorter yes. notice will be required. Yeah. Yes, but exactly how many? There has to be some number of limitations. No? So that's what that's my good question is that exactly how many board meetings could be shall be convened? You can convene the infinite board meetings in the one day, no? So that's why my question is. Thank you. See, if I have to answer that question, infinite board meetings in a day, only an insane person will do it. <laughs> No, there because, is something fishy uh, there. There is something fishy, definitely. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Not the board bad. meeting is not. It should be, it should be a structured meeting. Board so meetings are... Hit the nail on the head. That's what I want to say. Samir, as per law, it is permitted. As per law, there is no prohibition as such. You can have three, four board meetings if the requirement is there. If you, anybody is doing infinite meetings and all those things, that's what I have mentioned it. And definitely the regulator's notice, if it goes, it will be, I mean, you know, it leads to further complications. Uh, I will add, if I have to, Mr. Samir, I remember one case also where, uh, you know, in a short uh, period, board meeting was shown and the board were questioned how they, uh, you know, executed all this business in how many days and the board was questioned. This event has happened. So actual meeting proving will be required by you. So if you are doing board meeting, it is for some business, right? Whether that business can be done in that period, that they will check. If otherwise, as it is already informed to you, no limit and you also know. That's why you are raising this question. Yes, law is not uh, barring you. But in that case, you should be able to prove that you are doing this meeting to do the business. And that business you have conducted yeah. in that board meeting. That if you do, then yes, by yeah. law. Not required. If you want, you can have four meetings because your board wants. And why the, the question arose, why you did not continue the board meeting? Means after one meeting is over, you remembered another new thing to come. How you do short notice and how that you can be done. That all to be think over, no? Yes. Thank you. From from the the, thank you. From which date the 12 months begins? Somebody has already answered from the date the board meeting I see last attended. Please refer the. No, sir. No, no, no. One minute, one minute. I will not agree with this thing. It is not from the day the last board meeting is attended. It is not a correct view. You have to say when the next board meeting is called. Hmm. The day when you are not able to attend the board meeting. There are the two views are there for this. Because, say, for example, I have attended my last board meeting in the month of March. Hmm. The next board meeting is conducted in the month of June. So are you going to count it from March? Are you going to count it from June? Because my next board meeting, which I can attend, which I could not attend, was from the June. If I am not wrong, this particular aspect has been clarified in the guidance. Not kindly yes. go through that. Yeah, I have highlighted also your right, Sudhakar. Yes. It's the meeting after the last meeting Correct. which you attended. Yeah, yeah. It's clarified. The last meeting attended should not be counted. It is the meeting yeah, yeah. from because where he is not attended. attended. That should be counted. Yes. yes.
Okay. I think somebody has also said that it is already dealt in the guidance note. There is only CF... my cell phone I replied to him. Okay. CFO is not the board member. He can be invited for the board meeting. Okay. CFO, whether he has to be sent the notice, etc. and all, I said, no, he is not a board member. He can be only invited for the particular item. That's what I said, actually. Can alternate director be appointed for attending the meeting of the foreign director residing outside India? Answer is yes. And then he is never expected to attend the meeting at all in India. Then question arises, oh, you are appointing a director when he is not at all interested in attending the meeting. You can appoint for the foreign director. But if the person is not at all going to be attending any of the meeting, then what is the purpose? I don't know. Sir, I would like to add only one thing here. Yeah. Under the though it is there, this concept of alternate directors is there in the 2013. Post uh, when the directors are permitted to attend the meetings through video conference and the purpose and their presence is counted for the purpose of quorum also, mm -hmm. the relevance of appointing alternate directors is completely lost. Correct. I don't yeah, it's become redundant. actually today. Yeah, it is redundant more or less, even if yeah. that foreign director is not coming. And moreover, that particular provision might be there only for one reason. Earlier, the physical presence of the quorum was required for four or five items. That's why yeah. still the alternate director requirement was there. That might be the only reason why it is that provision is there in 2013 Act. But now that also has been removed. You can do anything and everything in a virtual meeting. Correct. So now the alternate director concept is completely redundant. You're more or less redundant only, there is nothing actually. Hmm. Correct. What, what is the other recognized mode of sending the notice circular resolution? Email or post or hand delivery. That is the thing, because that is what normally happens. Can the company wait for the remaining one third of the director to respond if the resolution defeated by two third on the third day for circular resolution? Yeah, that seven days period, you can always wait. There is no problem. But the thing is, in the seven days period, even one third is there. If the two thirds is already defeated, the circulation stand to be defeated that particular point of time. Can director ask a copy of the minutes? See, during the tenure of his term, he is anyway getting the minutes because it is required to be circulated. Even the dropped minutes, even the signed minutes, it is actually required to be circulated. The minutes, if we are talking about prior to his joining as a director, he has got only the right of inspection. I don't think he can have a copies of the minutes at that particular time. He can have a right to inspection, actually. Are we supposed to give certified copy of the minutes under RTA Act 2005? in case of the government companies, or they are under the purview of RTA Act. I think if it is RTA, then we don't have a choice, no? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't come under RTA, if I am not wrong. The it minutes will not of the come board the meetings... RTA. Minutes of the board meeting will no. not come under the RTA Act at all. Come. No. Yeah, it will not come. Sometime income tax authorities insist on seeing the minutes. Are the company bound to producers? Of course, because income tax is the regulatory authority. Regulatory authority, we are bound to give. There is no issue. Yeah. Now, everything is shared over the email. The question of giving the copy only comes in all the cases. Be it auditor or director, everyone communicate through email. They can make copies as much as they want. No, here... The, cop the copy of the minute goes only to the director, not to the others. We are not sharing the copies of the minutes uh, to third parties here. When you are talking about the auditors, or where we are sharing with the auditors and all those things, it is only the for only the director. Thing, only thing, let me add, let me add uh, one or two things here. To keep the confidentiality of the minutes, several large companies like Reliance and all, they use the board want as portals. In the portal, what we do is we upload the agenda, and then we upload the minutes. Any other backup papers also, we upload it only. And this completely, this is an encrypted board. Whatever we are uploading it, no one else can read. Only the concerned person with the password and login ID can only read that. When he is uh, putting that password and uh, the, that log, when he logins, then only it will be converted into the read uh, readable language. Otherwise, it will be in an encrypted mode, number one. Number two, in this particular uh, what's called portal, Neither they can download, nor they can copy, nor they can forward. They cannot do anything except that reading. The only technical issue, if at all it is there, is he can take photograph of the slides. That's it. Otherwise, he can't do anything. And that much confidentiality, I mean, that much uh, what's called as you know, faith we have to hand our directors, you know, number one. Number two, 
Now, for the but only thing is this is a slightly costly affair because having this board vantage portal and all we have to pay in dollars to them. It is slightly costlier. There are a number of portals which are available even in India also, and I'm sure that several companies might be using that. There also, what happens is that you will be giving the login ID and password and restricting completely all other things. If you are sending to your directors by way of an email, that means you are losing the confidentiality and the sanctity of the minutes as well as the agenda papers. So, adding to your point, where I was working in the Vodafone group of companies, what they have done, they have actually created what we call the shared drive only for the board members. That's all. So, as you rightly say, all the agenda items, all the relevant papers, all the minutes, everything is posted only in the shared drive and it is available only to that particular group only. Nothing else is Correct. there. That is what they've been actually doing. It. See, in our in our subsidiary companies at Reliance, we did the same thing is that directors have been given password. They can log into my server and my server only that information is available. They can only read that. That's it. They cannot do beyond that anything. If the draft resolution circulated with the agenda papers is discussed and modified during the discussion, then I think in that case, the modified resolution can be recorded in the minutes. I have answered this, yes. It is already discussed. I have also, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have yeah. answered it also. It is already asked. Previous minutes to be meant at the previous approved minutes. I don't know what is this relevance actually, Rupesh. Rupesh, are you there? Can a director having a copy of the signed minutes share it to on behalf of the company? Where is the position of on behalf of the company? Because the minutes are shared only with the directors. It is only for his information. It is not for the circle. It is not open for anybody else. Even if he is sharing it with somebody, he is uh, doing unethical practices. He should not actually. It is only for his purposes. What if the chairman only refused to sign the minutes? We already answered this question. If the chairman so is refusing, you have to answer. We already answered yeah. that. The board has Correct. authorized somebody. How long director is to maintain the agenda minutes? Are they also bound to for eight years? No, for it is not applicable to the director. It is up to him. It has been said for his meaning. If he want to preserve, he can preserve if he doesn't want. The eight years period or permanent preservation is applicable only to the companies. Please share a copy of the presentation for our record. Yeah, because the whole webinar is getting recorded. It will be put on the YouTube channel. You will be getting it in your register, mail ID and the phone number, whatever it is, etc. It will be available to you. What if I own minutes are not there since the company is very old and the minutes are not available or misplaced? Non-compliance. You have to maintain. You are supposed to maintain even in case of the amalgamation merger also, the whole company has to yes. supposed to pass on the minutes to the new company. This is totally a non-compliance. As a good practice, director can give back the board no, agenda. Minutes, etc. Yeah. So it is always good in case there is any fire or incident or some natural disaster always to file a police complaint and record officially that yes, the statutory document has been or like uh, some uh, uh, records are you now in flood and all those things damaged. Then you can have uh, some photographs or something and then you can pass a board resolution after filing this or having authorization for filing and all those things. When you are talking about, you know, the act of God unforeseen circumstances, are the, there are various uh, regulatory provisions are already there, actually. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, that is why the many companies, what they do is they have the disaster plan because they store the documents elsewhere, the similar copy, so that if something goes wrong, etc., they can actually retrieve it. That's what they are doing. Company has to work out with the disaster plan or something like that. If we are keeping a copies, etc., yes, you can actually follow the procedure intimating the government authority. This is what has happened. You can recreate regarding that reason. That provision is always available in all the acts. The only thing is the only thing is sir, that by merely quoting the force measure reason, you cannot yeah. simply get away with that. You have whenever the uh, what's called regulatory authority institute a prosecution, you should be able to establish that. What are the Correct. preventive measures you could take? But despite that, it was beyond your control. Then it is a different thing altogether. Yeah, yeah. I am also talking only the genuine case. Not on a simple, I... simple basis, they cannot get away. You know, by filing an FIR, FIR can be filed by anybody and everywhere. 
in fact i'll tell you one thing in in our own case it has happened way back in uh, somewhere in 1990 where that central excise uh, regime was there actually in one of the particular place where we had the central excise records we normally ship the records to the archival place and keep it but in the current place we keep only for the three years period suddenly some fire took place and all the thing all the records got actually damaged when the, all the records got damaged we went and uh, filed a police complaint and we approached the central excise commissioner and we talked to him and those days we are supposed to give a copy of the monthly return this is rg1 register rg23 register etc and other thing and also even the stock register so we requested them to give a copy from them we took the copy from them we actually recreated those documents and then we got it certified these are all recreated in the records of the central excise that is why we actually revived the documents at that particular time it's all available actually but uh, as you rightly say it is only the genuine cases not for getting along and finding out the excuses etc or other thing at all as a good practice director can give back all the board agenda minutes etc to the company least it follow into the newspaper wala many company they do I, that actually. i think uh, mr bala the answers we will not discuss let them uh, give on the questions now pick up 130 we have cross people are started okay. leaving now yeah, yeah, can correct, correct. can attendance sheet be serially numbered financially or wise this yes you can choose either you can be a financier calendar whatever you choose that i think we discuss here please sign the attendance sheet tampering with the meeting number can that calendar year or find this i we already answered meeting notice can be set any time no working hours requirement yes up to 12 o'clock because if you are sending the email it is 24 by 7 we are working is it necessary to send the proposed agenda resolution with the agenda notes board can discuss and make changes to the same right which can be miss normally non routine item etc we actually say this is the proposed uh, resolution also we give the top resolution i think sarda has already answered this right yeah 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 i would suggest director to maintain the agenda and the minutes uh, yeah sharda has already written this yeah she has already yeah can a chairman of board ask for a copy of the video recording of the minutes video recording of the minutes what is this video recording of the minutes i have not heard what they are meeting bigger recording oh, done for the no, no, one minute one minute this question this is a very important question sir this is a very important question what this gentleman is asking in one of our joint venture companies our joint venture partner was asking for the video recording of the board meeting and that point of time the company secretary said we cannot give it and he said no that i don't agree with you must give it that point of time i attended that particular joint venture companies board meeting in my group and we told them categorically video recording cannot be given and no director has a right to do that because it is having the sanctity of the meeting only thing what we said was the video recording can be seen by him and if, then he was mentioning some legal department issues and all those things we said that considering the as a courtesy if at all it is imperative for you we can show that video recording but we cannot give the copy of the video recording then he asked me one more question can i do the audio recording i want to record the entire proceedings on my phone we said no not no. not permitted a director has no right to even right. record the things if he is doing without permission you can confiscate his phone also because these so. issues these issues might be looking very silly and very small <clears throat> issues when everything goes smoothly very serious these I issues will the... become very serious when this thing is coming up and believe it or not in four continuous board meetings this issue we were discussing it and then ultimately what happened was to ensure these kind of things i have been asked by management my my by my management to become a director of the company so that i can talk to him authentically also you know because at one point of time virtually this question has come up what is your role in this particular company because neither i was a company secretary in that company nor i was a director in that company only thing is that company belongs to the group so when this issue has come up yes te technically officially concerned legally i have no right to speak in the board meeting i was only an invitee but yes no doubt about it that immediately my management says join the board so this issue is very very important the answer to that particular gentleman is that you don't need to provide the video recording to the director the director legally has no right to ask for the video recording at the most if he wants to see he has to give the purpose for what he wants to see the video recording a video recording may be shown to him provided it is available after one year as sharda has rightly mentioned after the audit you can destroy the recording 
If the recording is destroyed, you can say goodbye. Uh, we, we cannot do it. Better always, whenever you are destroying the video recordings, please take the approval of the board and make a minute of that particular destruction also. So I that think, tomorrow uh, is not a question. Yeah, Sudhakar, you rightly brought it. It's, it's a very useful point. When we say chairman is responsible for integrity of the meetings, for example, you said somebody wants to record. I think these are things which he must make sure it doesn't happen. So when you say integrity of the meeting, it's a very broad word, but these are all the points which have to be taken care of. Whether utterance sheet to be bound like a minute's book? If yes, then what would be the maximum time limit to bind the utterance sheets? It is there in the standards and guidance not Please refer to uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Sir, it is a non-compliance. How it can be recreated? Yes, old minutes. If no data is available and who is responsible for that? It is the new company secretary. What is the remedy available? No remedy, I think. Here. No remedy is available because of the disaster situation. Yeah. No, 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 one minute, one minute, one minute. I will answer this question. Suppose if your minutes only are destroyed, you can recreate it based on the records available. You cannot simply raise your hands. Please understand that technicalities are involved here. You cannot simply raise your hands. The records are available. If not in-house, at least they are there with the ROC. As much as the records available with ROC, you have to collect that. Based on that, you have to recreate the minutes. You cannot say, no, the minutes are not available and all the records are to be recreated. Possibility is there. See the how much serious that issue is and all. Don't take it that lightly. And in fact, if I am not wrong, I don't remember exactly when doing my articleship in one of the companies. I mean, I my articleship is almost about three decades before it is. We have recreated the records for one particular company. That point of time, what we did was we went to Arvos's office. We virtually camped there. We could take certified copies of the records. Based on that, we have recreated the minutes. And you, like a, not possible. you yeah. in a current meeting, whole meeting, adopt all these minutes, mind correct, data, correct. and say that. And that minute should be written that it is based only based on the MCA. If Absolutely. the management has certain information and other supporting documents somewhere, then you have to add that management information. This minutes is prepared. So you totally agree with you. And add totally agree. the board in the current right. date. And, so uh, and, authorize the, and authorize the person to sign that minutes also. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. I think we have answered all the questions. Yeah, and that's all. Somehow we but, managed only five minutes. We have gone ahead. And I thanks. Ms. Sarda, Sudhakar, Ms. Bala, and all participants for your contributions. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sudhakar, you would like to declare yeah, I, next week? Yeah, only thing I would like to mention to the participants that uh, we have at Mehta and Mehta, we have taken the initiative of uh, declaring the month of February as Secretary Standard Month. And we started already with SS1. Next week, SS2 is going to be there. And uh, I mean, I'm delighted to say that uh, Savitri Parik has given the confirmation, who is my colleague at Reliance. And of course, she was also on the SSB board along with me and Deepthi and a very dear friend also, and very knowledgeable, uh, what's called a professional. I'm sure you all would like to listen to her. So do attend uh, next week. And after that, SS3, the, uh, the dividend is going to be there and SS4 also is there. Again, the, as of now, I met to get the confirmation for SS3. We are getting the Mr. Sanawla Khan from Vipro, the company secretary of Vipro. For SS4 board's report, we are uh, invited uh, Mr. Manikantha, who is the secretary of Infosys. And uh, subject to their availability, in fact, uh, uh, at Mehta and Mehta, we are making efforts to bring excellent professionals to deal with such excellent topics. Thanks very much to every one of you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sarda. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank everybody. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Bye -bye. Sarda. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Let's meet next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.